single malt drama, a mafia romantic comedy, Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, Book 3, written by Catherine M. Hurst, narrated by Charlotte Claremont and Aaron Shedlock. Chapter 13, Marco. The little velvet box in my pocket mocked me. I proposed, and she'd said yes. The ring should have been sparkling on her finger, but she'd started talking about rules, and I'd chickened out. Technically, I was an engaged man, but as Nico reminded me, the marriage was a business deal. I'd arranged security for my trip to the courthouse, picked up Nico's counterfeit birth certificate, had our contract drawn up, and gotten the marriage license in less than three hours. However, tracking down Father Brian, my family's go-to priest, and convincing him to conduct the ceremony on the sly without the prerequisite counseling and other bullshit took for freaking ever. Add in a few hours of research at Marchione Corp to dig up dirt on Mayor Carter, and I was ready to crash. I dragged my tired ass up the stairs and ran into Enzo, carrying a bin of tiny rocks. What the hell is that? He smirked. It's a litter box. You found her cat? If we were correct about the Abruzzos, they'd burned Shauna's apartment down and killed her cat, or so we thought. Yes, Enzo lowered his voice. We took down two of the Abruzzos' guys and caught a traitor. She's downstairs. Why did you bring her here? When I had been small, my father had brought a man to the mansion. I didn't remember much except the guy's screams and finding Hildy cleaning up gore from the laundry room floor. And people wonder why I have phobias and can't stand the sight of blood. I'll explain on the way. Follow me. He walked toward his room. One of my employees was either working for the mayor or the Abruzzos. I intend to find out which and what exactly she was doing for them. I swallowed hard. And then what? Then I either have her arrested or scare into hiding. Thank Christ. I thought you were going to... I can't hurt a woman, no matter what she's done. Does that make me soft? I clamped a hand on his shoulder. No, bro. It makes you a decent human being. Where is she? In the laundry room with security. I took the makeshift litter box from him. Go downstairs. I'll help Shana with the cat. Thanks. He scrubbed his hands over his head and walked downstairs. Shauna met me in the hall. Dark circles shadowed her eyes and her skin looked paler than usual, but what worried me was the way her hands trembled when she took the plastic bin. Where's Enzo? He went to deal with our guest. I frowned. What the hell happened? She leaned against the door frame. A woman called. She claimed to have gotten my number off one of the missing cat flyers in the quarter. You should sit. You look like you're going to pass out. I placed my hand on her upper arm and guided her into the bedroom. The whole thing seemed fishy, so we arranged a meeting. Shauna sank onto the bed next to the fattest cat I'd ever seen. The orange and white hairball hissed at me and darted away. Turns out she was one of Enzo's longtime waitresses. Nodding, I said. What's this business about you two taking people down? We had a little help from some friends at the New Orleans PD. They took Abruzzo's men in for questioning. She sucked in a breath and stood. I should get downstairs. I want to be there when Enzo questions Tara. My brain misfired. Tara Cole? Yes, do you know her? I knew Tara, all right. We'd had a one-nighter a couple of years back. She was one of the rare women I'd become friends with after her role in the sheets. Yeah, we hang out sometimes. Shauna sighed. You and Nico don't need to be involved in this. Stay upstairs. I'll let you know what Enzo and I find out. Thanks. I followed her to the door, but went in the opposite direction when we reached the hall. Tara freaking Cole, what have you gotten yourself into? My folks had warned me and my brothers about getting too close to outsiders. So much so, we'd mostly kept to ourselves in school. That had ended when we discovered girls, but I, for one, was always wary of trusting anyone with our family secrets. I racked my brain for anything I might have said to Tara that she could have told the Abruzzos. While I didn't think I slipped up, I couldn't be entirely sure. Why the hell did I stay in contact with her? Because I'd trusted her. She was Enzo's employee. She was a mom for crying out loud. I opened the bedroom door and stopped in my tracks. Nico had stretched out in the center of the bed, wearing a pair of itty-bitty pajama shorts and a tank top. She laid on her stomach, reading a book with her knees bent and feet in the air. Cute wasn't a word I normally use to describe Nico Lazio, but in that moment, she was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. She glanced up from the page and flashed me her cover girl smile. Marco, did you get it? 
I nodded, unable to form a simple word. Nico sat upright and tilted her head. You were gone so long, I was worried. Call me selfish or foolish or any number of other issues, but I didn't want to tell her about the woman downstairs or Abruzzo's men or that I'd bribed a priest to fake marry us. I'd miss the way her eyes lit when she smiled and meant it. I couldn't bring myself to ruin her mood. Everything's great. I should have called. I didn't mean to worry you. Kicking my shoes off as I went, I made my way to the bed and plopped down with my head next to her legs. She ran her fingers through my hair. Are you all right? As long as you keep doing that, I'm golden. Meeting her gaze, I said, this time tomorrow, we will be married. Her fingers stopped moving. You spoke to a priest? Yep, he's meeting us in a small parish church outside the city tomorrow night at 10. I wrapped my fingers around her wrist and moved her hand back and forth over my scalp. She tugged my hair, laughed, and resumed the caresses. Do we need to bring anything? Everything that had happened after she'd said yes had gone by in a blur of nerves and frustration. I'd focused solely on the legalities and logistics and hadn't given any thought to the ceremony itself. You'll need a dress and flowers and a cake. I'd stood beside Gabe when he'd married the love of his life, Maggie, not three weeks ago. But I came up blank with what else went into a wedding. I don't need any of those things, Marco. She stretched out beside me. Turning my head in her direction, I said, maybe I do. Maybe I want to see you walking toward me in a white dress. Where the hell did that come from? There isn't time for that. Brides order their gowns months in advance. She rolled to her side and rested her hand on my chest. But there is one thing I would like. Lying there with her, staring into each other's eyes, felt like the most natural thing in the world. I could get used to this. For a while, anyway. Name it. Nico whispered. I would rather our first kiss not be in a church in front of a priest. Did you forget? We've kissed before. We were in fifth grade. You had a boyfriend. You were worried he would try to kiss you, and you didn't know how. She leaned closer. I didn't have a boyfriend. You tricked me into kissing you? Inching toward her face, I couldn't help but grin. I didn't want you to say no. I could never say no to you, Picolina. I brushed my lips across hers once, twice, three times before delving deeper. She tasted like warm blueberry syrup and promises whispered under the blankets. She tasted like my past and my future. I'm so screwed. Scooting closer, Nico opened her mouth wider and kissed me back. Between her soft moans and tentative hands moving over my back and shoulders, I was a goner. Much to my surprise, Nico met me on every turn. My entire world narrowed to a heartbeat of time between our lips meeting and parting. When I pulled away, she sighed the sort of sigh that men lived for. The kind that told us we'd done something very right. With everything around us going wrong, that small breath was like a life preserver in a raging ocean. Marco? Shauna knocked on the door. Can I come in? Tara, she, it's worse than we thought. Shit. One sec. Sitting up, Nico trailed her hand down my arm as if she wasn't ready to stop touching me. A sentiment I shared wholeheartedly. I stood, straightened my shirt, and adjusted my cock before opening the door. Shauna stood with her hands in her pockets and her shoulders slumped. Her eyes and cheeks were red as if she'd been crying. Tara's been working for the Abruzzos for quite some time. She's stonewalling Enzo until she knows her kids are safe. Drew and Sammy? I'd met her children a couple of times. The oldest was in preschool and the youngest hadn't started walking. I didn't want to think of something happening to them. She gave me an odd look. I didn't catch their names. Where are they? With her ex-husband. Shauna visibly shook herself and squared her shoulders. The Abruzzos know the address. Enzo needs you to get a security team over there to take them someplace safe. I'll bring them here. Is that wise? Nico said from behind me. Fuck, I was going to have some serious explaining to do. With everything going on, our security team is spread thin. It'll take a day or so to find a place for Tara and the kids to hide and arrange security for them. Nico frowned, but nodded. I glanced back at Shauna. I'll take care of it. Thanks. By the way, I owe you both an apology. Before the call with Gabe, she drew a deep breath. I thought I was doing the right thing by pushing Enzo away, but I didn't think about how that would affect the two of you. Nico offered a sad smile. 
There's no need to apologize. I thought the same thing. I mean, Enzo and my marriage would solve some problems. And cause a shitload more. I shook my head. No way in hell would I allow either of them to martyr themselves. So you and Enzo are solid? As solid as we can be, given the situation. She grinned before turning and walking down the hall. Nico waited until I closed the door before asking, What is going on? Who is this Terra person? Enzo and Shauna had an incident with the Abruzzos tonight. She stared open mouthed. Why didn't you tell me? I was planning to, but when I saw you in those tiny pajama shorts, I shook my head and forced myself to focus on something other than my dick. One of Enzo's employees has been working for the Abruzzos. He brought her here, but he's not going to hurt her. Okay, she furrowed her brow. Does he know what he is going to do with her? Scare her and get her talking? After that, I'm not sure. If he'd rather not get involved. No, I'll help any way I can. Nico hesitated, glanced down, and finally back to me. You know this woman and her children? She's a friend of mine. I kissed her cheek. Just a friend? Yep. To cover the quasi-lie, I motioned to the door. I should get downstairs. I'll come with you. Give me a minute to change. She walked to the dresser and picked up the shorts and t-shirt she'd worn earlier in the day. You're going to need more clothes. Yes, but in the excitement at the airport, I didn't keep any of the money I stole from my father for myself. And I haven't been able to get to my secret stash here. She closed the bathroom door behind her. Babe, just write down your sizes and make a list of the items you want. I'll have Hildy order whatever you need. I laughed, despite my mood. And don't forget to include a white dress. Chapter 14 Nicolina Memories of waiting in other armored SUVs with other armed guards flooded me. This wasn't the first time I watched someone I loved put themselves in danger, but I told myself this was different. Marco had gone inside the house to save two children, not to extract mafia justice on someone who'd wronged him. Still, I couldn't shake the sense of deja vu when he strode up the walk and pounded on the door like one of my father's enforcers. Are you all right, ma'am? The guard in the front seat stared at me in the rearview mirror. No, I'm definitely not all right. Forcing a smile, I said, I'm fine. Please call me Nico. Stuart. He turned his attention back to the small track house on the outskirts of New Orleans. Marco emerged, carrying a baby in one arm and a small child in the other. Unlike some men who tensed up and moved like robots when handling kids, he walked with his usual easy grace. However, there was no mistaking the hard set of his jaw. A second guard stood on the front porch, discreetly holding a gun to a shirtless man's side, while the third jogged ahead and opened the back door to the SUV. Take him. Marco handed me the baby, a chubby little guy with snot oozing from his nose. Wincing, I settled the soggy toddler on my lap. I'd never spend time around young children. I was the youngest of my family, and none of my brothers had married, let alone had kids. The little guy stared at me with the biggest blue eyes I'd ever seen, and I knew two things for certain. One, I wouldn't let Sofia Abruzzo or anyone else hurt this child. And two, I wanted one of my own. Daddy! The boy couldn't have been older than four, but he struggled to break free from Marco's grasp. It's all right, son, I'll get you back. The guy on the front porch was either desperate or stupid. Ignoring the gun pressed to his side, he shouted, You can't take my kids. I know who you are. I'll call the police. Marco struggled to get the older child into the back seat, but the boy moved quicker than a spider monkey. He extended his skinny arms and grabbed the door frame one second and kicked the next. What the hell is Marco thinking? The Abruzzos won't think twice about putting a bullet in that man's head. We can't leave their father behind. You know what will happen to him. Scowling, Marco motioned to the guard on the porch. Bring him. The white showed all the way around the man's pupils. Where are you taking us? Marco shot me a see what you did look and called over his shoulder. We don't have time for this. Get in. I'll explain later. Oh, for goodness sakes. 
I pulled the baby closer to my chest and climbed out of the SUV. Please, sir, you and your sons are in danger. We're trying to help you, but you need to come with us now. The man looked me over as if I were an all-you-can-eat buffet. I can protect my own. Get back in the vehicle, Nicolina. The ice in Marco's voice surprised me. I'd never heard him use such a hard tone. Not yet. I turned back to the father and motioned to the armed security team. Don't be an idiot. There will be twice as many men here any minute. Get in the SUV or you won't live long enough to call the authorities. He swallowed hard, strode to the SUV and slid in beside his older son. I climbed back in and rubbed the now screaming baby's back. It's okay, Sammy. We're going to see your mommy. Marco settled beside me and made goofy faces at the baby. Sammy took one look at him and nuzzled into my shoulder. I had a difficult time making sense of Marco's behavior. He'd barged into the house like he planned to shoot anyone who got in his way, and now he cooed to a toddler. Stuart put the vehicle in drive and sped away with the other guards following us in a second SUV. Time to buckle up, Drew. The father helped the boy fasten his seatbelt. One of you needs to tell me what the H-E-L-L is going on. Marco opened his mouth to speak, but I rested my hand on his arm. The last thing we needed was for the two of them to get into another shouting match. I turned and looked the man in the eye. I'm Nicolina. Once again, he checked me out. Pete, Pete Cole. Your ex-wife is mixed up with some very, I glanced at the kid and chose my words carefully, interesting people. They won't be happy if she stops doing business with them. He ran his hand over his mouth and chin. I told her not to get mixed up with the Marchionis when she took that damned job. What does she do? She starts sleeping with pretty boy there. That's enough. Marco ground his teeth. Tara was Marco's lover. Is that why he's so worried about her children? I'd asked him outright how he knew the waitress, and he'd lied to me. I don't know what Pete saw in my expression, but he shook his head. Do you know what you're getting into with the Marchionis? Or it is their M-A-F-I-A. Most people in Sicily spoke of the Cosa Nostra in whispers, and yes, some treated us with disdain, but I'd never heard someone spell it out as if it were a curse word. I had no idea how to respond. Marco said, keep talking and I'll show you how real those rumors are. Pete went pale, turned his head, and stared out the window. We spent the remainder of the trip in silence. Even the baby seemed afraid to utter a peep after the way Marco had threatened his father. Stuart parked in the driveway of the carriage house adjacent to the mansion and checked his cell phone. You're needed inside, Mr. Marchioni. We'll take them inside and get them settled. Without as much as a glance my way, Marco exited the SUV. After you, Pete motioned for me to go. His voice had softened, but the hatred in his eyes seemed to grow with each passing second. Go ahead. I had questions but I wasn't ready to face Marco. It wasn't any of my business who he'd slept with. That he'd lied hurt more than the truth ever could have. Pete and Drew climbed out and stood staring at the manicured grounds and house. Nico, Marco held his hand out to me. Rather than showing weakness in front of strangers, I took it, but I let go the second my feet were on the ground. I'll help get Pete and the kids settled. Enzo needs us inside. I forced a smile and settled Sammy on my hip. I'll be in in a few minutes. He gave me an odd look and strode inside. Stuart nodded to a side door of the carriage house. This way. We followed him into what looked like a war room. Computer monitors covered two long built-in desks, different angles of the interior and exterior of the main house, as well as the grounds, flashed on the screens. Two men, dressed in the requisite black cargo pants and t-shirts, glanced at us as we passed. P 
Pete swallowed hard and gripped Drew's hand tighter. Upstairs was nothing like the first floor. Cozy couches and a television took up one side of the space, and what I assumed were bedrooms occupied the back half. A small kitchen area separated the two. Stuart clasped his hands behind his back. Make yourselves at home. There's food in the fridge. Use the intercom to call down if you need anything for the little ones. Pete glanced around. Is there a phone? Your friends didn't give me time to grab my cell. No, sir. You won't be making any outgoing calls tonight. He clenched his jaw. I stepped between the men. Stuart, please get some paper and a pen for Mr. Cole. He's going to need supplies for the baby and kid-friendly food for Drew. The little boy grinned when I said his name. And some toys? Drew nodded. Yes, ma'am. Stuart walked to the kitchenette. Pete narrowed his eyes. Why are you helping us? Because I know what it feels like to leave your home with nothing but the clothes on your back. With Stuart keeping a watchful eye, Pete and I spent a half hour making a list of the items he would need to get through a day or two with the kids. By the time we'd finished, I was exhausted and in need of a stiff drink. Thanks for this. Pete offered me a genuine smile. You're welcome, but I couldn't leave you here with nothing. I'm pretty sure the little one needed a diaper change hours ago. I winced at the growing wet spot on my thighs. He frowned. You seem like a good woman. What are you doing with a bozo like Marchioni? He's not what you think he is. A mobster, he barked out a laugh. Stuart cleared his throat. Pete glanced over his shoulder at the other man, then leaned close and lowered his voice. I don't like him because he's been fucking my ex-wife for a couple of years now. But let me ask you a question. Years? My heart lurched. Okay. Why did he bust into my home with armed men? Why not knock and speak to me like a human being? I hated to admit it, but he had a point. I knew Tara was into some questionable shit. I would have listened to reason. He didn't have to scare my kids. He sat back and folded his arms. Because we didn't have time to explain. Because your lives were in danger. Because that's the way it's done. Chapter 15, Nicolina. The emotional whiplash of the previous hours wore on me as I made my way toward the office. It bugged me that Marco hadn't told me what had happened with Tara or the truth about his relationship. But if he had, we wouldn't have shared that amazing kiss. A kiss that I couldn't bring myself to regret, though I knew I should. Marco had behaved far too much like a mafioso for my tastes, even if he'd done it to save children. The last thing I wanted to do was sit in on another conference call with the Marchioni boys, but I hoped I could piece together enough information to see the bigger picture. The Abruzzos were in New Orleans to take over. That much was clear. What I didn't know was who, if anyone, in Sicily knew and supported their plans. The brothers might not know it yet, but they needed me. I knew the players, the rules, and how to cheat better than they did. Which is why Marco needs to keep me informed. I walked into the room, nodded to Enzo and Shauna, and took a seat as far from the speakerphone as possible. Papa Joe's gravelly voice drew my attention. This waitress... Will she make a statement about her involvement with Joe's accident? I spoke to her. She's agreed to tell the police in exchange for you helping her start over. Shauna glanced between Enzo and Marco and frowned. Enzo took her hand. He means, will she testify in Sicily to the heads of the other families? Oh, shit. Maybe? Shauna blushed. I felt bad for her. I couldn't imagine being thrown into the middle of a mafia war because I'd fallen in love with the wrong man. 
And despite her attempts to push him off on me earlier, I had no doubt she was in love with Enzo. Shauna had a lot to learn and a short time to do it. Gabe said, tell her she's going to speak to the Italian authorities and in return, she's getting a week vacation in the beautiful, sunny Palermo. Enzo frowned at the phone. We'll get the poison and the waitress on a plane as soon as the meeting is scheduled. Poison? What poison? Joe died in a car wreck. Papa Joe said, good. Once the families know the Abruzzos tried to have our entire family eliminated, they will have no choice but to retaliate. Marco must have seen my confused expression because he moved to my side and whispered, they ordered the waitress to poison the soup at Gabe and Maggie's engagement party. I'd attended the event and remembered Enzo saying something about someone pouring acetone in the minestrone. I whispered, Fingernail polish remover smells horrible. That's more of a warning than an assassination attempt. Tara didn't go through with it. She panicked and poured acetone in the pot instead. He sighed. What they gave her could have killed or injured everyone at the party. The gravity of what he'd said hit me. I was there, and so were Joe's children. This cannot stand. All eyes turned to me. Even the phone line went quiet. Oh no, no, no. Marco swore under his breath. If there is nothing else, I smell Hildy's sausage and mushroom quiche. I'm going to catch a couple hours of sleep. Enzo spoke louder than necessary. Papa Joe cleared his throat. Nicolina, is that you, dear? Yes, I'm here. My words came out shakier than I would have liked. I didn't realize you were in New Orleans. There are quite a few people looking for you. I'd messed up, big time. Rather than cower, I squared my shoulders and spoke in a calm, clear voice. Your sons were lovely enough to allow me the use of the company jet and a temporary place to stay. I hated to threaten a terminally ill man, even if the threat was veiled, but I'd made my point. If Papa Joe blabbed to my father, the Marchionis would face blowback. I'm glad to hear you're safe. His sickly sweet tone hardened. Make yourself at home. You'll be one of the family soon. Thank you, but I won't be staying long. I prayed he bought the lie. If it was a lie, Marco and I would need to rethink our plans now that more people knew my location. Nonsense, nothing has changed. Your father and I expect a wedding this weekend. You and Enzo can return to Sicily together. Shana muttered under her breath and turned away. Trying to figure out my next move, I glanced between Enzo, Shauna, and Marco. I had nothing, no cards left to play. Marco and I could continue with our plans, but we'd need to run as far from New Orleans as possible. Marco pointed to his left ring finger before motioning between himself and Enzo. I knew the answer before I asked the question, but I'd try anything to find a way out of this mess. Gabe, did my father specifically name Enzo as the Marchioni I was to marry? Yeah, he did. Gabe sighed. I see. Think, Nico, think. Marco shoved his hands in his pockets and stared at the floor. His crestfallen expression broke my heart, but it also made me question his feelings for me. Does he want more than a fake marriage? My stomach fluttered, but I put the thought out of my mind. We had things to discuss before I walked down the aisle, real commitment or not. I will have a talk with him. I stood and moved closer to the phone. His demands are impossible. I am married to someone else. Enzo glared at Marco, but he grinned his goofiest grin and shrugged. 
That certainly complicates things, Papa Joe chuckled. I'll leave it to you to share the joyous news with your father. Thank you. I wanted to run from the room, but my feet refused to move. Enzo said, Good night, Pops. Marco pressed the disconnect button before his father could reply. You two are married? Enzo cracked a smile. Not yet, but we will be. Marco looped his arm through mine and escorted me out of the room. I didn't know if I wanted to laugh or cry. I shouldn't have said that. Laughing, Marco grabbed my face in both hands, pressed his brow to mine. That was freaking brilliant. Don't bother telling your father. I'm sure my mother is already burning up the phone lines. Brilliant? I felt as if I would faint, and he acted like I'd just cured cancer. Don't you see? The Abruzzos are going down. Your father wants to keep the balance in his favor, right? Yes. I knew where he was going with this, but didn't have the heart to tell him our situation had become infinitely more complicated. With them gone, he let us out to keep the upper hand with the remaining two families and control which new ones come to the table. Bada bing, bada boom, the marriage thing goes away. Marriage thing? Mine and Enzo's, or does he mean ours? I pulled away. You must be relieved. He looked at me as if I'd asked him to join the priesthood. Relieved? You think I'm going to back out on you now? I shrugged. No way, not after what I went through to get the license. His smile wilted, unless you're having second thoughts. No, if anything, this news makes me more desperate for a way out. Once again, he stared at me as if I were insane. You know the legend of the Hydra? You cut one head off and two grow back. Other families will rise to fill the voids. The question is, which ones and how awful will they be? Yes, but Hercules was able to defeat it with a little help from his cousin, or in my case, my brothers. Marco slung his arm around my shoulder. Have faith in me. I do, but we need to talk. You lied to me about Tara. I did, and I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Why did it happen in the first place? He ran his hand over the back of his neck. Here's the thing. You and I, we've known each other a long time. I've told you things I would never tell a girlfriend. Like how many women you've slept with. I could understand his predicament. I'd felt much the same about sharing my lack of experience. Exactly like that. He turned my face toward his. It was stupid, but I didn't want you to feel awkward or jealous. Do you plan to have sex with her again? It was only one time, but no, I don't. Once, I frowned up at him, but Pete said, Pete's a jealous asshole. Nodding, I said, and you swear no more lies? Yes. Then nothing has changed between us. I'd done the very thing I made him swear he'd never do. I'd lied partly by omission and partly outright. The way he'd behaved at Pete's house scared me more than I cared to admit. No matter how I felt about Marco, I wanted as far away from the mafia as I could get. Great, then we have a wedding to plan. For the second time in as many days, Marco swept me into his arms and carried me upstairs. Chapter 16, Marco. Not to brag, but I'd bounce more than my fair share of women on mattresses. Some of them laughed, and some gave come-hither smiles. Hell, most of them pulled me down with them. Nico did none of those things. She frowned and sat upright. I'm talking ramrod straight spine, knees to her chest, arms wrapped around her legs upright. I couldn't imagine a more closed-off posture. Unless, of course, she'd tucked her head. What's wrong? Stupid question, but I was at a loss. Nico sighed, shifted her weight, and sat cross-legged with her arms folded. What happened on the call before I came into the room? 
not much. We came up with plans to sink Mayor Carter in the Abruzzos. I sat in front of her. We should really talk about the wedding. She glanced away. I told you, I don't need all of the fuss. This is a marriage of convenience, a temporary business deal. Her words hit me in the solar plexus. Where is this coming from? Rubbing the center of my chest, I asked, if you're still upset about Tara. I have no right to be jealous of her or any of your other lovers. She'd said the right thing, but the venom in her voice said the exact opposite. Then what's wrong? I motioned to the bed we were sitting on. She dipped her chin. I'd known her far too long to play these sorts of games. She obviously had something on her mind, and I wasn't going to utter another word until she shared it with me. Nico glanced at me, sighed, and turned her attention to her nails. Fingers splayed, she frowned and picked at her cuticles. Come on, babe, give me something to go on here. I arched her brow. She repeated the process with her other hand. By the way she wrinkled her forehead and rolled her lips in, I assumed she was rehearsing what she wanted to say to me. I waited not so patiently. Narrowing her eyes, she said, Okay, fine. I'm still upset you lied to me about Tara. Nice try, but that's not all. What's on that beautiful mind of yours? I nodded, but otherwise remained impassive. I don't want to be a mafia wife, her voice cracked. What the hell? That's great, because I don't want to be a mafia husband. She gave me an impatient look. Scratching the side of my head, I ran through the events of the previous couple of hours. Are you upset I wasn't going to bring Pete Cole here? She groaned, and I knew I was in trouble. I'm freaking lost here, Nick. I nudged her side. Use your words and tell me what I did wrong. It isn't what you did wrong, not entirely. Yes, you should never have considered leaving him behind, but that's not the problem. She switched back and forth between English and Italian as she laid into me. You walked in there ball swinging and guns out like an enforcer. There were children in that house, children you scared. You might not want to be mafiosi, but it is in your blood. It's who you are. I forced my brows down from my hairline. I didn't have time to sit down and discuss the situation over tea. I had no way of knowing when the Abruzzos would show up. And the man, Pete, you would have left him there to die if not for me? She jabbed her index finger in my direction. Okay, she has me there. I ran my hands over my head. You're right. I should have insisted he come, but Pete and Tara don't get along. She froze in place, stared and lowered her voice to a growl. You wouldn't have anything to do with that, would you? What? No, they were divorced before I met her. At the risk of earning myself a slap across the face, I took her hand. Nico tensed, but didn't pull away. Listen to me. I held her gaze until she nodded. I can understand why you feel the way you do. I handled things badly, but I wanted to get in and get out. You were in the car. I was worried the Abruzzos would show up and you'd get caught in the crossfire. Her expression softened. At work, I'm used to issuing orders and getting things done. It has nothing to do with wanting to stay in the mafia or taking after my father. I brushed her hair back from her face. Nico leaned into my touch. Tell me how you and your family intend to handle the situation with the Abruzzos. I planned to kiss her, but she pulled away before I had the chance. My father is sending me proof of illegal campaign contributions, bribes, and payoffs he's made to Mayor Carter. Maggie, Gabe's wife, was a reporter. She's going to write up a press release with my father's statement. I'm going to leak this statement and proof to the media. Her eyes widened. That will ruin your family, too. Maybe, maybe not. Pop seems to think a scandal will increase the Marchioni mystique and drive more business to our bars, hotels, and restaurants. I'd gone along with the plan during the call, but now that I explained it out loud, I saw the million ways it could go wrong. You're planning to make money off your family's reputation as mobsters. She pressed her lips into a tight line. Exactly. Something like that. The other families won't approve. It goes against the number one rule of the Cosa Nostra. Don't share our secrets. You're going to break the omerta. Breaking the goddamn vow of secrecy was punishable by death. We were so focused on stopping Mayor Clark from helping the Abruzzos, we hadn't thought about the repercussions on the other side of the ocean. A smile ghosted across Nico's face. Although, if it spawns a last-ditch effort to save your businesses from a hostile takeover, it could work. Yeah? 
It's risky, to say the least, but I doubt the Abruzzos are working alone. They must have the support of at least one other family in Sicily. If Gabe plays this right, he could expose your enemies. Her voice cracked with her final words. You think your father is involved? It's a possibility. I sucked in a breath. You heard the part about flying Terra to Palermo to testify against the Abruzzos? Yes, but without proof. And those working on getting the poison Sophia Abruzzo gave Terra. She claimed she buried it in her yard. I hitched a shoulder. While it's still one's word against another's, it's going to be hard to explain where a waitress got her hands on enough botulinum toxins to poison 300 people. Nico furrowed her brow. I nudged her side. You were good with Sammy. Thanks, but I don't have a lot of experience with kids. She might have played it down, but between the way she'd comforted the baby and the twinkle in her eyes, I could all but hear her biological clock ticking. Hang around Gabe and Maggie a while. They have a litter. I laughed to hide my sudden case of nerves. She tilted her head. Do you want that? A house full of children? A warning siren rang in the back of my mind. With any other woman, that question would have sent me running for the door, but this was Nick. She had me contemplating all sorts of things I'd sworn I'd never do. Sure, one day. My phone dinged with an incoming email. I glanced at the screen inside. It's the information from my father. I need to take care of this. It won't take long. I'll order some clothes and a white dress while you're working. She leaned forward and brushed her lips across mine. I'm supposed to work after she did that? Nico swayed toward me again and I took it as an invitation. How could I not? She was the kind of woman who made men break the rules. If she'd lived in another time, kings would have waged war to possess her. She had a body made for sin and a heart made for white dresses and flowers and forevers. A soft moan escaped her mouth and she moved her hands over my chest, arms and shoulders randomly, as if she couldn't figure out where to touch me. Without breaking the kiss, I grasped her hips and pulled her forward until she took the hint and settled in my lap with her long, tan legs circling me. I wound her dark hair around my hand and tugged her head back to expose the length of her neck. While kissing a line from her full lips to her collarbone, two things occurred to me. One, I could do this for the next six months, nine months, or nine freaking years, and it would never get old. Two, no one or nothing is going to stop me from giving her the sort of life she wants. Nico pressed closer and let out another soft moan. Slowly, almost tentatively, she ground herself against me. I saw stars. It didn't matter that we were both fully clothed, or that the angle of my cock meant she was getting off on the folds of my jeans instead of my body. It was the hottest non-sex sex I'd ever had, until my phone rang. Nico stopped moving. Ignore it. I drew her nipple into my mouth, t-shirt, bra, and all. What if it's Enzo? She pulled back. Babe, the last thing I want to hear you say right now is my brother's name. Tugging her hair, I pulled her head to the side and nuzzled into her neck. The damn call went to voicemail, but whoever it was, he redial. Nico set her hands on my chest and pushed me back. It must be important. Grumbling, I took the phone from my back pocket. Marchioni, I would like to speak to my daughter. I recognized the baritone voice instantly. Pietro Lazio. Chapter 17 Nicolina I couldn't move. After screwing up and speaking during the call with Mr. Marchionni, I assumed my father would learn my location. Oddly, I hadn't expected him to call. Papa was more of a send someone to kidnap me in the middle of the night kind of guy. The color had drained from Marco's face, but he somehow managed to keep his voice steady. Nico is busy. How can I help you? I couldn't make out my father's exact words, but Marco's frown deepened. Yes, she's married. He met my gaze. My heart thundered and fireflies danced in my peripheral vision. I shook my head and held up my hands. Please stop talking. Hang up. Please just hang up. Marco winked. He freaking winked and grinned and patted my thigh. 
I'm not at liberty to say who she married. My father's voice echoed through the room. You little shit. Put my daughter on the phone now or I will peel the flesh from your bones one ribbon at a time. I reached for the phone, but Marco blocked my efforts. He stood and walked toward the door. As I said before, she's busy. I'd be glad to give her a message. If my father was working with the Abruzzos, he had men at his disposal in New Orleans, men who could easily reach the mansion. I had to do something to de-escalate the situation before Marco verbally dug his own grave, if he hadn't already. I drew a deep breath and shouted, Marco, do you know where I put my passport? I can't find it. Narrowing his eyes, he tightened his grip on the phone. Yes, sweetheart, you packed it in your carry-on bag. My stomach twisted. Sweetheart, does he have a death wish? We hadn't discussed it, but I assumed we were on the same page about not sharing the name of my husband or soon-to-be husband. You will put my daughter on the phone, now. My father made every word seem like a threat. I held out my hand. Let me speak to him. One moment. Frowning, Marco handed the phone to me. Pronto, papa? My voice quivered. Nicolina. He drew my name out on a sigh. Nicolina. His tone surprised me. I'd expected him to shout threats, but he sounded so unlike himself, almost defeated. Hi, Papa. I pressed my hand to my chest. I can't talk long. I am catching a flight. Nico. You will come home and bring your husband, yes? Come back to Sicily with my husband? I turned to Marco and bugged my eyes. He made a circle with his thumb and index finger and moved his other index finger in and out of it while mouthing, honeymoon. My God, he's enjoying this. I can't, we are leaving for our honeymoon. Grinning like a kid on Christmas morning, Marco did the hula, complete with arm movements and some heavy-duty hip action. The contrast between speaking to my father and my fiancé's shenanigans made my brain malfunction. In Alaska, we are going to Alaska. You do not know what you have done. Dad sighed and mumbled something incoherent about secrets and lies and repercussions, there will be blood on your hands, Marchioni blood. I took a step back and gripped the dresser to stay upright. Something was wrong, more wrong than me running away from home to avoid an arranged marriage. You're scaring me, what secrets? Marco moved my side and draped his arm around my shoulders. You should be scared, we should all be. Why didn't you tell me it was Marco you wanted? We could have avoided so much drama. Come home, Nico. Bring him. The three of us must talk. We can fix this, but we must talk. My breath caught in my throat. I wanted so badly to believe him, to believe he would leave me and Marco alone, but I knew better. What's done is done, Papa. I have to go. You will return to Trapani, he shouted. You will regret it if you don't. Ciao, papa. I disconnected the call. Holding me close, Marco walked me to the bed and sat beside me. Don't let him get to you. He was trying to scare you into following orders. I hope so. But he was, he was so unlike himself. Resting my head on his chest, I said, he mentioned something about secrets and repercussions. Marco wiped away a tear with a pat of his thumb. He was manipulating you. I'd witnessed my father's manipulation techniques many times over the years, but he'd always come at the person from a position of strength. The entire conversation unnerved me, but then again, that was what he wanted, wasn't it? One thing I knew for certain, 
my father didn't stand for disobedience. Since I'd made it clear I had no intentions of returning to Sicily, he'd send someone to bring me back against my will. Marco, we should leave here as soon as possible. He nodded. I was thinking the same thing. Give me an hour to send the press release and Pop's dirty financials to the media. Then we can decide where to go. I forced a smile. I have to find a white dress and send Hildy out to buy a trousseau. A what? He arched a brow. Is that French for grass skirt? It's clothes for our honeymoon. Snuggling closer to him, I whispered. Or in my case, just clothes. He captured my chin between his thumb and index finger, turned my face to his, and met my gaze. Temporary marriage or not, we will have a honeymoon. Will you dance the hula for me on this fake honeymoon? I'd come to hate the words temporary and fake. When we weren't trying to be anything other than ourselves, it would have been so easy to forget about our arrangement and pretend the marriage was real. However, every time I let my guard down, Marco reminded me where I stood with him. Maybe he's doing it to protect me. Maybe he's managing my expectations so I won't get hurt. If that were the case, he'd overlooked a fatal flaw in his plan. I was in love with him before he ever asked me to fake marry him. Every day and twice on Sundays. Go talk to Hildy before I kiss you again and we lose all track of time. He stood and walked to the desk in the corner of the bedroom. I would have loved nothing more than to spend an hour or so wrapped in his arms, but he was right. We had things to do and a ticking clock hanging over our heads. Should I have her pick up anything for you? I'm good. He spoke without turning his head or taking a break from typing. I need your signature on our contract. Contract? The room tilted. I'd call it a prenup, but that doesn't sound right either. He stood and handed me a document. It's the statement outlining the reasons we're getting married under duress. The trembling started in my fingers and wound its way through my entire body. Rather than allowing him to see me crumble, I snatched the paper from his hands and left the room. I walked through the seemingly empty house under a cloud of despair. But if I were honest, the document was only part of the problem. Since I'd arrived at the mansion, I couldn't shake a growing sense of unease. I'd spent the first 26 years of my life on a schedule. People told me where to be, when to be there, how to dress. Sometimes my father would go as far as telling me what to say to his business associates. Without the structure, I felt as if I was floating through the days rudderless. I'd run away to avoid the marriage, but also to get control of my life. So far, that hadn't happened and I had no idea how to change it. I ducked into Papa Joe's office, scribbled my name on the so-called contract, and stuffed it into an envelope. Rather than taking it back to Marco and having to face him, I shoved it into my back pocket on the way to the kitchen. Hildy glanced up from the stove and smiled, but her expression dimmed when she saw me standing in the doorway. Can I get you anything? I glanced at the pile of zucchini, squash, and other vegetables on the counter. Marco said you could help me buy some clothes, but if you're busy, she set the large knife on the counter. Don't be silly. I'm just tinkering around in here to have something to do. Are you sure? Enzo's a Michelin star chef. He can find his way around the kitchen. Hildy dried her hands. I don't suppose it's a good idea for you to leave the house. So I'll need a list of what you need, the sizes, and any specific designers you prefer. Actually, I'd prefer simple clothes from a department store. Pants and shorts with pockets would be great, and some t-shirts. I laughed, never thinking in a million years I'd send someone to the mall to purchase my clothes. Hildy gave me a knowing smile. I take it you'll be staying here for the foreseeable future. I hated to tell yet more lies, but I wasn't sure how much she would relay to Evelyn, Marco's mother. Instead, I went with a vague reply. We haven't decided, 
but summer clothes should work. Jot down your sizes and any color preferences. I'll take care of the rest. She handed me a pen and paper and motioned to the kitchen table. It's wonderful to see you and Marco have stayed friends all of these years. I recognized a fishing expedition when I saw one, but I had no idea how to respond. Marco and I had led our parents to believe we were already married. Had Evelyn told Hildy? What if I tell her the truth and they compare notes? He's an amazing man. I focused on making a list of items I needed from the store. She chuckled. He's a rascal, and we both know it. But he sure is sweet on you. We're just friends, sat on the tip of my tongue, but I swallowed it down. The feeling is mutual. Hildy rested her hand on top of mine, effectively stopping my list writing and forcing me to meet her gaze. Nicolina. It might seem like he's a duck in water, letting everything roll off his back. But that's not the case. A duck? What is she saying? I'm not sure I understand. She leaned closer and lowered her voice. Marco puts on a show to convince the world he's invincible. He uses humor to hide his feelings. And when humor doesn't work, he uses his sex appeal or bulldozes his way through his problems. Like what he did with Pete Cole. I couldn't help but smile. She wasn't trying to get information out of me. She was worried about one of her boys. It's none of my business. But do you love him? Hildy's world seemed to hang on my response. She was to Marco what Maria was to me, the women who'd raised us, even though we weren't theirs, but loved them just the same. Yes, so much, sometimes I feel like I'll drown in it. It felt good to say the words aloud. But I'm not sure he feels the same way about me. The elderly woman squeezed my hand. You have nothing to worry about. He feels the same way about you. He's just not ready to admit it. The envelope in my back pocket told me otherwise. I don't know about that. He reminds me we are friends every chance he gets. Is he reminding you or trying to convince himself? She laughed softly. I believe he's loved you since he was too young to know what love was. Every time he came home from Sicily, he'd talk about nothing but you for months on end. I wanted to believe her, but at the same time, his actions told a different story. That was a long time ago. She bit back a grin. Not that long, only a couple of days. An ember of hope warmed me from the inside out. He talked to you about me since he came home. I mean, of course he had to tell you why I was here unannounced, but he did. She narrowed her eyes, but her smile never faded. Don't go and ask me what he said. I can't tell you the details. I threw my arms around her and hugged her tight like I had Maria and Alessio. Hildi, could you find a white dress for me? Something simple but romantic. Her cloudy eyes twinkled with mischief. Ah, so the rumors aren't quite true. I hesitated, hoping I hadn't made a mistake in trusting her. As if she read my mind, she smiled. My darling girl, take a breath. I may work for Evelyn, but that doesn't include spying for her. My priority is and always will be my boy's happiness. Mine too, well, one of them anyway, I sighed. We're not married yet, but we will be very soon. Hildy stood, come with me, I have something you might like. Chapter 18, Marco. 
What should have taken an hour tops ended up eating most of the day. I'd followed my father's instructions to the letter, which included sending Maggie's press release and the financial records to back it up to over a hundred media outlets. Once that momentous task was finished, I'd arranged for Tara, Pete, and the kids to stay at my family's vacation home in Gulfport. By the time I'd organized transportation, security, housekeeping, food deliveries, and ordered enough toys to fill a box truck, I was exhausted. What's taking Nico so long? I glanced at the clock and frowned. Not only had I skipped lunch, I'd missed the local evening news. I hit the power button on the TV remote to search for national coverage. The screen came to life, and my knees gave out. Sinking onto the edge of the bed, I stared at the picture of my father I had sent out with the press releases. The news feed crawling across the bottom of the screen consisted of quotes from the statement, and the banner below my father's face read, Dying man exposes decades of corruption in New Orleans. Holy shit. Still holding the remote in my hand, I jogged down the hall and pounded on Enzo's door. Enzo? Shauna? You guys decent? No, they shouted. Having no desire to see my brother in all his naked glory a second time, I yelled, you might want to turn on the television. Movement inside the room told me they'd heard me. A moment or two later, Enzo opened the door wearing a pair of jeans and a scowl. What's going on? I folded my arms and rocked back on my heels. I sent the story about Pops and Mayor Carter to every media outlet on the list. Oh, shit. He sat on the bed beside Shauna and turned on the television. It's going exactly as planned. Better, actually, since the news broke, people are coming out of the woodwork to accuse Carter of everything from blackmail and extortion to murder. The screen flashed with a red and white breaking news logo. A petite blonde reporter pressed her finger to her ear and raised her microphone. I'm reporting from outside a private residence in Lakewood. We're waiting for Mayor Jefferson Carter to be taken into custody. The camera zoomed out to show New Orleans' finest dragging Carter out of his house and shoving him into the back of a police cruiser. Oh my God. Shauna glanced between Enzo and me with wide eyes. We did it. Enzo frowned. What are they saying about Pops? Not much. I leaned against the wall as Enzo flipped between channels. It seemed like the coverage focused on Carter. Only a few reporters mentioned our father, and of those who did, none as much as hinted at our rumored affiliation with the mob. Shauna whistled. Maggie must have done an incredible job spinning the story. I thought they'd eat Papa Joe alive, but the media is acting like he's a hero. Let's hope it stays that way. That's because he's either golfed, played poker, or vacation with most of the media conglomerate owners. Shauna frowned. Is there anything the Marchionis don't have their fingers in? There's a dirty joke in there somewhere. I pushed off the wall and plopped into a chair near the window. Thank you for your restraint. Enzo turned to Shauna. To answer your question, if it can benefit Pops, he's involved. I'll let you two lovebirds get back to whatever it is you were doing. I pushed to my feet. Enzo stood and grabbed my shoulder hard enough to prove a point, but I had no idea what. Not so fast. Did Tara and her kids get settled? I spun out of his grasp. Yeah, she called when they arrived. She seemed happy with the place. I thought they went to Jack's old fishing cabin. It's a dump and not great for young kids. Shauna had made arrangements with Jack, her best friend for Tara and the boys, to stay at his place in the bayou. I didn't know him well, but we'd cross paths at Chamber of Commerce functions in the quarter. He'd always seemed like a decent guy. I shook my head. Pops didn't want to take a chance on her getting lost between now and her flight to Palermo. He had her put up in our vacation villa in Gulfport. It's four bedrooms, oceanfront, and behind a wall. Plus, I ordered a round-the-clock security for her family. She'll be safe there. That sounds a heck of a lot better than Jack's place. Shauna shook her head. I shoved my hands in my pockets. About that, do you think he'd mind if someone else used the cabin? I don't think so, but I should ask. She tilted her head. Why? Nico and I need to get out of town for a while. Enzo rounded on me. What the hell is going on with you and Nico? After the day I'd had, I didn't have the energy to sugarcoat the situation. I don't know. He folded his arms. What do you mean you don't know? Are you married or not? We have a license. I hitched a shoulder and played dumb, rather than filling him in on the rest of our plans. He ran both hands over his head. Why? Why do you think? What the hell is up with the 20 questions? Was I standing there asking him about his intentions with Shauna? Oh, right. I did that already, and he said he'd have fun until he kicked her to the curb. Interestingly enough, she'd almost been the one to do the curb kicking while on the phone with Gabe. Don't marry her for us. Enzo and I will figure something out that doesn't involve you marrying her. Shauna crossed the room and stood in front of me. 
I'm not doing anything for anyone except myself and Nico. I don't know what she saw in my expression, but it made her smile. You want to marry her? He doesn't. Enzo glared as if daring me to contradict him. Nice try, bro, but it isn't going to work. I can speak for myself. I'm not doing anything against my will. Shauna must have done something behind my back because Enzo's eyes widened. Rubbing the back of his neck, he said, If this is what you want, I'm happy for you. But I don't have to tell you her father may not feel the same. And you think Ma is going to throw you to a party? I glanced at Shauna. No offense. None taken, she grinned. Enzo squared his shoulders. Our relationship won't be a problem with Ma or anyone else. If it is, I'm prepared to walk away from the business and the family. What the hell? When did that happen? How did that happen? Is that even a possibility? Shauna gasped. You can't mean that. What about your restaurant? Your family is... I'm a Michelin star chef. I can work anywhere. As for my family, my brothers love you. He shrugged. Pops didn't say anything negative about you on the phone this morning. I believe you impressed him. She gave us a dubious look. Um, he demanded you marry Nico. And that's not a problem anymore. I took a bow. Thanks. Shauna didn't seem convinced. Would your father have insulted me with everyone on the call? Laughing, I nodded. Hell yes, he would have. As for my mother, she has enough to worry about besides meddling into our personal lives. Gabe isn't happy with her working with Pietro Lazio to shove a marriage up mine and Nico's asses. Still reeling from Enzo's declaration, he'd leave not only the business, but the family. I cleared my throat. Speaking of Gabe, I don't think he's going to be thrilled with you walking away. He's the one who suggested it. Bullshit. I didn't believe him for a second. He was showing off in front of his woman. When did he do that? Before I left Sicily. Enzo glanced at Shauna so we could be together. She dipped her chin, but not quick enough to hide her blush. I'm stunned, but I guess I shouldn't be. Gabe's a stand-up kind of guy, and the two of you are good together. I turned to Shauna. About that cabin, why isn't it suitable for kids? It's deep in the bayou in Terrebonne Parish. She frowned a motion with her hands like an Italian. She's been spending way too much time with Enzo. Not only does she have the hand gestures down pat, she's talking in circles. And? and it's only accessible by boat. The place sits up on stilts, which is probably a good thing, considering all of the gators and snakes down there. Snakes? Why does it always have to be freaking snakes? But they can't get inside, right? I haven't been there in years, but I don't remember anything other than spiders coming inside. The gators and snakes won't mess with you if you don't mess with them. Shauna flashed me an evil smile that had me taking a step back. She had no way of knowing I hated most reptiles and all spiders. Unless, of course, Enzo had told her. I see. I glared at my brother for good measure. Surely she's exaggerating because he blabbed some stupid stories from our childhood. I doubt anyone will find you. It sounds very secluded. Enzo grinned. That'll work. God help me, I hope they're just busting my balls. Shauna reached for her phone on the nightstand. I'll call Jack. I'm sure he won't have a problem with you and Nico staying there. Great. Let me know what he says. I walked out of the room and didn't stop until I reached the pool deck. I promised Nico a honeymoon. How's she going to react to a snake-infested cabin in the middle of a freaking swamp? I pulled myself from my pocket and called the family priest. He answered in the second ring. Hello, this is Father Brian. Hi, Father, this is Marco Marchione. That thing we discussed, are we still on? You're referring to your wedding? I pinched the bridge of my nose. Yes, we've had a bit of a situation. He sighed loud enough I could all but feel his breath on my cheek. I'll be at the chapel at ten this evening. I hesitated. Not because I was doubting my decision, but because of the way it would all go down. Marchione's married once. We did it big and splashy, surrounded by friends and family. I couldn't give Nico more than a quick ceremony and a ring. Thank God I have a proper ring. The whole temporary fake marriage thing was starting to bug me. Divorce wasn't an option in my family, and as far as I knew, no one had ever gotten an annulment or disillusion or whatever the fuck the church wanted to call it. But that wasn't the problem. The more time I spent with Nico, the more I dreaded letting her go. It's not like I'm in love with her or anything. I enjoy her company, uh, that's it. But that wasn't it. I was lying to myself, and I knew it. Marco? He asked. Are you there? Yeah, Father, I'm here. We'll see you then.
Chapter 19, Marco. A month ago, if anyone would have told me I'd be standing at an altar waiting for my bride to make her grand appearance, I would have suggested they check themselves into the psych ward. But here I am. The empty church seemed cardboard plain compared to other Marchioni weddings. Then again, my mother had gone all out for Gabe's and Joe's big days. However, she wasn't here, nor were my brothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, or any other family members, except Hildy. My former nanny was the next best thing to having my mom present. She'd kiss more boo-boos, held more hands, and cheered on more sidelines than my mom ever had. Now that I thought about it, Hildy's attendance was better than having Ma involved and a hell of a lot less drama. I just wish she was standing beside me instead of helping me go get dressed. The thought stole the air from my lungs. I might have been okay with my mother's absence, but I missed my brothers. All of them, even Enzo's smug ass. I'd always assumed Dante would be the one to throw my bachelor party, razz me mercilessly about my ball and chain, and get teary-eyed when the big moment came. Father Brian glanced at his watch. Perhaps I should go check on the bride? I'll go. I'd left Nico and Hildy in the small changing room a half hour prior. The women had insisted it was bad luck for me to see the bride in her dress before the ceremony. While I doubted Nico would make a break for the exit, I couldn't shake the feeling something was wrong. Is she having second thoughts? The priest's eyes lit. Ah, I believe we're ready to begin. I followed his gaze to the back of the sanctuary and smiled as Hildy hurried to take a seat in the first pew. Nico stepped into view, and the oxygen left the room. My God, she's beautiful. The white satin dress reminded me of something from the 1950s, only without the poodle and with some serious sex appeal. The fitted bodice had just enough of a V-shaped neckline to hint at her cleavage without revealing too much for church. Likewise, the flared skirt hit at the knee and showcased her gorgeous tanned calves without showing too much. I couldn't take my eyes off her. With her hair swept up in a French twist and only a hint of makeup, she looked like an angel. Too damn good for me, that's for sure. Nico met my gaze and dipped her chin. The flowers I'd picked from my mother's garden trembled along with her hands as she walked toward me. I swallowed hard and ran my finger between my neck and collar. The room suddenly felt too warm, too confining, too everything. Holy shit, we're really doing this. I want it. I want her for real, not platonic house, not on a deadline. I want kids and a mortgage and forever. Father Brian set his hand on my shoulder. Are you all right, my son? Great, never better. Give us a sec, will you, Padre? I turned and jogged down the aisle to meet Nico. She glanced from me to the priest and back. What's wrong? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I took her hands in mine. Can we talk for a minute? Yes, of course, but her dark eyes brimmed with tears. If you've changed your mind, I... Come with me. I pulled her to the back of the chapel, well out of earshot of the priest and Hildy. Searching her face, I whispered, You'll have another wedding one day. A big one with mountains of flowers and music and guests. Hundreds of people looking for free booze and food and a chance to see the most beautiful bride that ever walked down an aisle. Nico blinked so many times and so quickly, I thought I'd given her a seizure. I wrapped my hands around her upper arms. Are you okay? I think so. She glanced around as if she'd just realized where we were. But Marco, I don't need any of those things. You're enough. Me? She can't mean that the way I want her to mean it. Chuckling to hide my disappointment, I pulled her close. Are you sure you're okay? Did you hit your head when you were getting dressed? Nico sighed and eased away from me. If you're having second thoughts, we don't have to go through with it. My second thoughts have nothing to do with marrying you. That's not it, Nick. I want to do this. But I was standing up there thinking about how much I wanted Dante and the rest of my brothers by my side. I thought maybe you were feeling the same way about the wedding. Father Brian cleared his throat. Shall we begin? Like I said, you are enough. The rest is just for show. Nico's expression softened as she looped her arm in mine and turned toward the priest. Yes, father, we're ready. My brain stumbled over her words like a drunk walking on cobblestone. I couldn't decide what she'd meant. I was enough for her because this wasn't real, or the simple ceremony was enough because she'd walk out of the church as my wife. 
My distraction proved to be a blessing when Father Brian launched into the prayers and liturgy and homily. The usually boring part of the ceremony flew by. Everything was going well until Father Brian asked, Marco and Nicolina, have you come here to enter into marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? Nico tensed and glanced at me. I nodded. We both sighed and said, I have. The priest arched a brow. Marco, do you take Nicolina for your lawful wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do you part? I do. I turned to her and tried to convey that I'd meant it. Not for six months or a year. I would love her until I took my last breath. Maybe longer. Father Brian asked her the same question. Nico held my gaze. I do. We continued to stare at each other, and it seemed to me we had an entire conversation in the time it took the priest to bless the rings and douse them with holy water. Nico gasped when I slipped the diamond ring under her finger. How? When? Grinning, I whispered, in the airport in Rome. Do you like it? I love it. It's just like my mother's. She glanced up and met my gaze. You remembered? I remember everything about you, Nick. I squeezed her hands. Does it fit? She nodded. Father Brian cleared his throat. Nico's cheeks burned bright as she fumbled with my plain gold band. It finally slid into place on her third try. Father Brian launched into the intercessions, followed by the Lord's Prayer and the blessings. But I barely heard a word he said over the blood rushing behind my eardrums. You may now go in peace. Father Brian made the sign of the cross. Wait a cotton pickin' second. I arched a brow. Did you forget the best part? Laughing, Nico elbowed me in the side. Flustered, my bribed priest quickly added, You may now kiss. Moving slowly to burn the moment into my memory, I cupped Nico's face. This close, I could see the hints of amber in her dark brown eyes and the faint scar on the bridge of her nose. The scents of vanilla and flowers, and something unique to her about drove me crazy. But I took my time. Nico inched closer, and the wisps of hair framing her face tickled the back of my hand. Unable to resist the quiver of her chin or the nervous lick of her lips, I pressed my mouth to hers. If I had any doubt about my feelings for her before, they vanished when she sighed that happy sigh of hers. I poured years of longing into the kiss. Every unheld hand, every uncaressed cheek, every unwhispered I love you. When we broke the kiss, she tilted her head as if confused. Hildy clapped and sniffled and clapped again. Congratulations, may I take your picture? Father Brian excused himself, likely to avoid any blowback from my folks. Not that his presence in the photos would matter. His name was on our marriage certificate. The entire affair would become part of city records in 30 days, give or take. I pulled Nico to my side and smiled for the cell phone. Hildy snapped several pics before hugging us both. I'm honored you invited me. You two make a lovely couple. Nico nuzzled closer. Thank you. I nodded toward the back of the chapel. You should probably get out of the dress before we go. My bride gave me a quick smile and hurried to the changing room. Hildy said, there's a change of clothes for you in the dressing room. Your bags are in the back of the SUV. I sent enough food to get you through the first few days. Bottled water, wine, and a little something special. Thank you. Once again, a feeling of disappointment settled over me. It seemed wrong to be going into hiding instead of to a reception to dance the night away with my bride. You know where you're going? Those roads down in Terrebonne can be tricky at high tide. I have a map and GPS to get us to the marina. I pulled the frail woman into an embrace. I don't know if we'll have cell reception at the cabin, but I'll call to let you know we made it to the boat. She cocked her head. That seemed awfully real up there. It was for me, but I can't speak for Nico. You can't speak for her, but you should speak to her. Hildy patted my cheek. And don't be sad about your brothers not being here. I have a feeling you two will do this again one day. I hope you're right. I cleared the emotions from my throat and wiped my eyes. You should get home. It's late. You know how Enzo worries. Mm-hmm. She nodded toward the changing room. You might want to go help your wife out with that zipper. It stuck on my wedding day, and that was 60-some-odd years ago. My eyes widened. You loan Nico your wedding dress? 
Who else is going to wear it? She squeezed my arm. Besides, the look on your face when you saw her in it made me glad I kept it all this time. I followed Hildy to the back of the church and gave her one last hug before I knocked on the door. Nick, need some help? Yes, please. The exasperation in her voice made me laugh. However, my laughter faded when I opened the door to find Nika with a dress unzipped to her waist. There was nothing sexier than a woman in the process of taking off her clothes. Or in Nico's case, attempting to. I shut the door behind me and closed the distance between us. Pressing my chest to her bare back, I slid my arms around her and placed a line of kisses from her earlobe to the cap of her shoulder. Marco, we are in a church. Thunder will strike us. Lightning, lightning will strike us, I chuckled. My point exactly. Her body language told me she wasn't worried about lightning or thunder, at least not the heavenly kind. She rolled her head to the side and reached behind herself to cut my ass. My dick hardened instantly. It's a good thing we're married. I brushed my lips over the shell of her ear. A knock at the door spoiled the moment. I gritted my teeth and closed my eyes. Yes, Mr. Marchioni, we've called ahead to the marina. We need to leave in the next five minutes or we're going to miss your guide, Stuart said. We'll be out in two. I wasn't overly thrilled about hiding out in the bayou to begin with, but getting there in the middle of the night put the fear of God in me much more than getting naked with Nico in a holy place. I damned sure didn't want to spend our wedding night lost in the swamp. Chapter 20 Nicolina Are you sure it's safe? I eyed what our guide called a john boat. To me, it looked like someone had cut a huge tin can in half and duct taped a motor to it. Marco ran his hands over his head. He hadn't stopped fidgeting since we'd arrived at the marina. Nope, but we're following Cyril to the cabin. If it sings, he'll save us. Swatting a mosquito the size of a small dog, I lowered my voice. Is it big enough? I've never been down here, but I've heard the alligators are huge. The color drained from Marco's face. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't gator-proof. I disagreed. While ours was in fairly decent shape, many of the vessels in the marina consisted of miscellaneous pieces and parts of metal welded together like a patchwork quilt. Cyril, who looked like he'd been old when dirt was young, spat chewing tobacco juice on the dock. You'll be fine, Cher, and gators ain't gonna bother you. Just keep all your parts in the boat. Thanks. I glanced to my new husband for moral support, but he'd turned the same shade of green as the murky water. Are you okay? Marco set the last of our supplies in the boat. I'm fine, just anxious to get to the cabin. The guy glanced between us. Jack Landry said you two were in some sort of trouble. My stomach sank. Not only did Shauna's friend know about our situation, he'd told Cyril. The old man hadn't stopped chattering since we'd arrived. How long would our secret hiding place stay secret? We were married tonight. Marco held up his left hand to show his wedding band. Her father doesn't approve. He flashed us a toothless grin. Congrats. It's doubtful anyone will look for us down here, but if they do, I trust you to tell them you haven't seen us. Seen who? What's your name again? He winked. Marco nodded and handed Cyril a fat envelope. Jack said you offered to bring us supplies from time to time. This is enough to cover the cost and a little extra for your trouble. I sure do thank you, sir. He tucked the cash into his pocket. What say we get going? Marco climbed into the boat and offered me his hand. Step down easy and move to the front to counter the weight of our stuff. The boat rocked like a fun house floor, but I managed to reach the bench seat without falling overboard. Y'all follow a little way behind me. If we get separated, look for the blinking red light. Cyril fired up his boat and pulled away from the dock. I glanced over my shoulder as Marco pulled the cord on our motor, the sight of his muscles straining beneath his t-shirt made my mouth water. My mind drifted back to our kiss at the altar and the speech he'd given me before the ceremony. Everything about him was a contradiction. 
He'd said I'd have another wedding one day, but had put a ring on my finger that was almost identical to the one my father had given my mother. He'd had me sign proof the marriage was a sham, but stared at me through the entire ceremony like he meant his vows. And that kiss. Thinking about it made my hands tremble. Maybe Hildy was right. Maybe he does love me, but isn't ready to admit it. Keep an eye on Cyril's boat, Marco called over the roar of the motor. I stared at the blinking red light, but between the tornado of thoughts in my head and the eerie beauty of the swamp, I had a hard time focusing. I found myself mesmerized by the silhouettes of trees along the banks, and at times overhead. A million stars twinkled in the sky, far more than I'd seen in Trapani. Even over the motor, the hum of insects filled the air. Which way did he turn? Marco let up on the throttle and glanced around the utter darkness. Scanning the area in front of us, I said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? His voice came out sharp and higher pitched than normal. We've been married less than two hours and he's yelling at me? He has to be close, keep going. Something large splashed nearby. Marco shot to his feet, which made the boat rock from side to side. What the hell was that? Holding on for dear life, I shouted, sit down before you fall in. A whistle split the silence, followed by Cyril's unmistakable voice. Y'all run out of gas? Thank Christ. He took a seat. At this rate, he'd exhaust himself with fright before we ever reached the cabin. I had to do something to distract him, or what I'd hoped would be an eventful wedding night would end with a bottle of wine and sleep, or worse, an argument. Marco turned and yanked the cord to start the motor. It's now or never. I stamped down my inhibitions and pretended I was one of my Parisian friends. The way your biceps bulge when you do that is turning me on. He looked over his shoulder and grinned. Yeah? I turned sideways on the bench, arched my back as if posing for the camera, and ran my hand down the front of my body. It's hot. The first thing I want to do when we get to the cabin is get out of these clothes. Marco swallowed hard. Christ, Nick, do you know what you're doing to me? I pressed my index finger to my lower lip, dipped my chin, and gave him my best wide-eyed, innocent stare. Am I making it hard for you to focus? He swore under his breath, opened the throttle, and sped after Cyril. We reached the cabin five minutes later. Unfortunately, the flirty heat between us faded when we saw the place. I wasn't entirely sure what I'd expected when Marco told me we were going to stay at Shauna's friend's fishing cabin. Having never been to the bayou, I imagined a real-life version of the animated Disney movie with a Creole girl, a frog, and a firefly. I wasn't that far off. The bayou itself looked exactly as I thought it would, but the cabin was unlike anything I'd ever seen. The little house sat above the water, perched precariously on wooden legs. Instead of a garage, there was a small carport-like structure, complete with a cloth canopy, to park the boat. Swallowing hard, I said, this is nice. I promise you paradise, he deadpanned. Marco and I unloaded the supplies onto the floating dock. We glanced at each other and up at the house. Neither of us spoke. It was as if Cyril had dropped us off on some alien planet instead of a couple hours south of New Orleans. We should go inside. I reached for the bags, but Marco stopped me. Let's check it out first. There's no one around to mess with our things. We should at least take the food up. I motioned to the trees. There could be bears or raccoons. Marco arched an eyebrow, but scanned the dark landscape as if searching for monsters. Shit. Just the food. Smiling, I loaded my arms with cloth grocery bags and walked up the stairs. Once again, I tried to distract him. My weapon of choice this time? My sexy catwalk hips way. Marco sucked in a breath behind me. I felt quite proud of myself until I walked through a spider web, missed a step, and tottered backward. 
He caught me before I sent us both tumbling to the dock below, but judging by the splashes, a couple of the bags didn't fare as well. The eggs, crap, and the bread. What else did I drop? Still half in his arms, I peered over the railing. Please tell me the wine survived. Don't worry about it. I'll have Cyril replace whatever we lost. He tightened his jaw. Wiping my face with my upper arm, I said, let's get inside. I'm covered in spider webs. Marco made a sound in the back of his throat. Spiders? It's okay. I've cleared the way for you. I would have facepalmed if my hands weren't full. I'd completely forgotten about his fear of insects, reptiles, and frogs. It was no wonder he'd never gotten over it. His brothers had tormented him mercilessly by putting creatures in his bed and clothing. I reached the top of the stairs, opened the unlocked door, and fumbled around for a light switch. How is it? Marco's voice came out strained. Better than the outside. Thankfully, the inside of the place was clean. No signs of eight-legged roommates or any other unwanted guests. A cozy living room with a well-worn couch and easy chair took up one side of the room and a small dining table the other. I walked into the kitchen and set the remaining groceries on the counter. The appliances were old but clean. I couldn't help but grin at the ugly brown with black trim cabinets. They looked like they belonged in the 1970s. Curious, I checked inside each cabinet and found neat stacks of dishes and cookware that I had absolutely no idea how to use. Smiling, I turned to Marco. This isn't so bad. He hitched a shoulder and dropped his groceries on the table. As long as the gators don't eat us and the critters stay outside, it'll do. Our eyes met and my pulse raced. This is it. We're here. Alone. No one to interrupt us. Marco closed the distance between us in one step. He reached up as if to cup my face like he'd done at the church, but instead pulled a pin from my hair and another and another until my hair came tumbling down. You were beautiful tonight. He tugged me close with one strong hand and slanted his mouth over mine. I melted against him. It felt like I'd waited my entire life for this moment. His kiss and the way he held my body so possessively made me feel wanted and loved and safe, like nothing could hurt me. Without breaking the kiss, Marco took a step forward, pressing me against the wall. I wrapped my arms around his neck and ground my hips against his hard length. His hands were everywhere, my face, my arms, my breasts. I thought I'd explode before we got around to taking off our clothes, and then he pulled away. Avoiding my gaze, he said, I have to get the rest of our things, and we should talk before we do that again. Talk? Is he kidding? I stood dumbstruck as he walked outside. The doubts I thought I'd put to rest prickled at the edge of my subconscious, but rather than feeling sorry for myself, I decided to put the groceries away. Marco returned and set our luggage by the couch. He opened his mouth as if to speak, but snapped it shut and walked to the kitchen. Did you find the wine? I put it in the cabinet. What's going on with him? Did you want to have that talk? Let's settle in first. I didn't want to settle in. I wanted to get whatever it was he needed to say out in the open. Swallowing my growing anxiety, I wandered through the cabin, opening doors and turning on exterior lights. Why is there a rope ladder in the bathroom? It's the law. The cabin has to have two ways to get out. The ladder is in case there's a fire or emergency and the stairs are impassable. He kicked his shoes off. Kill the outside lights. They'll attract bugs and bugs attract spiders. Weird and weirder. Can't have spiders now, can we? I checked the final two doors and found closets stuffed with hunting and fishing equipment. Where's the bed? Nick, we really should have that talk before we worry about what comes next. A slow grin spread across his face that sent a rush of heat through my body. Evidently, whatever was on his mind wasn't all bad, but we had a problem, a big one. I'm serious, there's no bed. 
there has to be a bed. He checked every door, even though I'd done the same thing moments before. There's no bed. I rolled my eyes. You don't say. We turned and stared at the couch as if it were a snake, coiled and ready to strike. Marco frowned. Toto, I don't think we're at the Ritz anymore. Chapter 21, Marco. I'd heard the term lovesick many times, but I'd always assumed it was a teenage thing like bad attitudes and peer pressure. I'd certainly never associated it with actual physical symptoms, yet there I was, vaguely nauseous and breaking out in a cold sweat. Why? Because I needed to tell my wife I loved her. Nico tossed an armful of pillows onto the fold-out couch and tilted her head. Is it as uncomfortable as it looks? I sat on the thin, lumpy mattress and bounced a couple of times for good measure. Absolutely. I wonder if Cyril could fit a memory foam mattress in his boat. Laughing, she walked into the kitchen with a sway of her hips that had my dick sitting up and taking notice. Down, boy. I planned to have a serious conversation with her. To do so, I needed my blood to stay in my brain. Nico bent over to add more items to the growing list, and I about swallowed my tongue. She'd changed into those cute pajama shorts that made her long legs appear even longer and tanner and more toned. Nick, grab the wine. I kicked off my shoes and settled against the back of the couch, or tried to. The second my ass hit the upper edge of the mattress, the folding mechanism triggered, and the center of the bed came off the floor, which made the foot fold up. The higher the center bar rose, the lower I sank until my knees were beside my ears. Mother of God! She gasped, went quiet, and finally erupted in a series of giggles. It's not funny. Laughing, I attempted to force my legs down, but the more I wiggled, the more I sank. A little help here? Still cracking up, she tugged at the sofa, but it was no use. My body acted like a doorstop and prevented the natural movement of the springs. It isn't working. Put your back into it. That's something I never thought I'd say to a woman in bed. I'm done for. This is karma, biting me in the ass for years of man whoring. Nico grunted, and the springs gave enough for me to plant my feet and push down with my legs. As soon as my ass lifted from the ground, I scrambled to the center of the mattress. Still laughing, Nico collapsed beside me and wrapped her arms around her middle. You should do it again when I have my camera. Hell no. I threw my arm over my face. I was worried about the gators eating me when the real threat was the couch. Are you injured? She scooted closer and rested her head on my shoulder. Draping my arm around her, I kissed the top of her head. Only my pride. Mother of God. She mimicked my voice and erupted in another fit of giggles. Laugh it up, chuckles. I rolled over and tucked her beneath me. Her eyes widened and her lips parted with a surprised gasp. The feel of her body under mine made me break out in another cold sweat. As much as I wanted to lean forward and kiss her until we were a naked tangle of arms and legs, I couldn't. I couldn't cross the line without laying my cards on the table. She raised her head as if to kiss me, but I pulled away. The confusion and hurt in her eyes ripped me in two. I eased off her and helped her to sit upright. Did I do something wrong? Her voice quivered. No, you've done everything right. I tucked her hair behind her ear. It's about the contract. Her face fell. I want to tear it up. I held my breath, waiting for her response. When she did nothing but stare, I added, I don't want a time limit. Nico furrowed her brow. I don't understand. Christ, why can't I just spit it out? I don't want a fake marriage. She pressed her hands together as if she were praying and brought them to her chin. But we're already married. Get a grip or you're going to screw this up. Yes, and I'd like to keep it that way. I swallowed to loosen the lump in my throat. Forever, if you'll have me. Nico's beautiful brown eyes widened. I dipped my chin. I love you. She covered her mouth and nodded several times. I love you too. Yeah? Yes. She launched herself at me. I caught her waist and held her close, but not close enough. Never close enough. Anything less than skin to skin seemed downright chaste. Just to be clear, no annulment or dissolution. We're doing the until death do us part routine, right? She groaned, took my face in her hands, and gave me a quick peck. Right. 
I press my lips to hers again, lightly at first, then more urgently. From there, our instincts took over, my body on top of hers, her tongue in my mouth, mine and hers, our hips moving in opposing unison against each other. We don't have to. We can take it slow. Slow, fast, hard, soft, whatever she needed, I'd gladly give her. I want to. As soon as she'd said the words, we started kissing again. I buried my hands in her hair, and she dug her fingers into my shoulders. Each sensation was new, but easy somehow. There was none of the usual first-time, new-partner awkwardness. We knew each other, maybe not in a carnal sense, but just as intimately. Chapter 22 Nicolina On my first morning as Marco's wife, I woke to the smell of coffee and an empty left side of the bed. Outside the cabin, it sounded like every bird in the entire state of Louisiana had come to the bayou for choir practice. I sat upright and pulled the blankets to my bare chest. Marco? When he didn't answer, I wrapped myself in the covers and wandered into the kitchen in search of caffeine. A note hung from the refrigerator. Nico, I took the boat into town for those essentials. Be back before dinner. Love, M. P.S. I made coffee. P.S.S. Don't you dare get dressed. Grinning, I rolled my eyes and filled the cup he'd left on the counter. I took a shower, got dressed, despite Marco's wishes, and folded up the sleeper sofa. I sat and watched the birds flit around for five minutes before boredom set in. While rummaging through the food Hildy had sent, I found a large freezer bag with four brick-shaped objects covered in aluminum foil and a note card. Lasagna. Heat covered for one hour in 400 degree oven. Uncover and cook 10 additional minutes or until cheese is browned. I think I can handle that. The thought of making Marco dinner made me smile. Sure, I was cheating a bit by using Hildy's frozen leftovers, but at least we wouldn't starve. Rather than staring at the walls until Marco returned, I tucked my cell phone in my pocket, grabbed my sketch pad, and walked downstairs to the dock. I hadn't drawn in months, let alone worked on any new designs. I let my mind wander as I roughed out a sketch of the water lilies floating near the shore. The memories of the previous evening brought a smile to my face. Marco promising me another wedding one day, him kissing me in the church, him telling me he loved me, and the fun we had exploring each other's bodies until the early morning. I couldn't remember a time in my adult life I'd ever felt so content, so free. I spent the morning daydreaming and sketching ideas for a line of clothing. Unlike the couture dresses I normally designed, these pieces were practical. For starters, they weren't dresses. The pants and shorts had pockets and easy-to-wear lines. Around noon, I felt the need to stretch my legs and traded the pencil and paper for a walking stick. On the backside of the cabin, I discovered a path that led through a grassy area. I put my earbuds on and ran through my playlist until I found Ed Sheeran. His sweet, gooey music fit my mood perfectly. Singing as I walked, I followed the hard-packed trail. Now and then, I stopped to take pictures of large white and gray birds, wildflowers, and a random turtle. The beauty of the swamp surprised me. It seemed something new and unexpected waited for me around every corner, including a patch of bright purple irises. I'd squatted down to snap a few photos to sketch later, when movement in the corner of my eye caught my attention. An alligator, as long as our John boat, and as wide as a cow, sat not ten meters from me. The enormous reptile dropped lower to the ground as if preparing to run a fifty-yard dash, or in this case, a ten-meter race to lunch. I froze. While we didn't have gators in Trapani, I'd encountered snakes and other wildlife while hiking, I knew better than to make any sudden movements, despite every cell in my body telling me to get out of there. The gator hissed loud enough for me to hear it over the dulcet tones of my favorite singer. I did what any woman cornered in the middle of the swamp by a man-eating beast would do. I screamed. 
the gator swished its tail, and I knew I needed a better plan than to stand there wailing like a banshee. A quick glance around told me I was screwed. The nearby trees were tall and sturdy, but none had branches low enough to reach from the ground. Heart pounding, I took a step back. The gator remained in place, but its slit-pupiled eyes remained fixed on me. Holding the walking stick in front of me, I slowly put one foot behind me, shifted my weight, and slid the other back in a slow but steady retreat. The reptile charged forward several meters. I screamed again and clenched the stick tighter. It stopped moving and stared, as if to see what I'd do. My breaths came in short bursts. If I didn't get control of myself, I'd hyperventilate and pass out, making myself an easy target, or easier target. I backed up again. The animal swished its powerful tail and rushed forward with its mouth open. Too scared to scream, I ran. A gunshot rang out behind me, followed by a man's shouts, two more shots, and a dog barking. I didn't slow or stop or risk a glance over my shoulder. I ran, as if my life depended on it, because it did. Cher, stop, it's Cyril, the old man called out. Slipping behind a tree, I shouted, Gator! It's dead, Cher. Everything's all right now. He approached me with his arms out as if afraid he'd spook me. The gesture would have worked better had he not held a rifle in his right hand. What you doing out here anyway? A large, reddish-brown, droopy-eyed hound dog sniffed my legs. I waved my hand at it, but it seemed unfazed. The dog plopped down beside me and rested his head in my lap. I went for a walk. I couldn't stop trembling in my legs enough to stand, let alone get back to the cabin. Marco had given Cyril money. From the looks of the envelope, a lot of money. But who was he? Could we trust him? Why are you so close to my cabin with a gun? Anyone with half a brain carries a gun in these here parts. You never know what you're gonna come across. He softened his tone. I'm not gonna hurt you, Cher. I live on the other side of the grass. I heard singing and came out to listen. Singing. Right, I was singing. You didn't mention you lived close. And you didn't mention you had a voice like an angel. He laughed. I'm setting the gun down. I peeked around the tree in time to see him place the gun on the ground and back away with his hands in the air. Feeling like an idiot, I pushed to my feet and stepped from behind the tree. Thank you. The hound stood and followed me. Cyril flashed me the same toothless grin as he had the night before. What for? Saving me from the gator, for starters. I brushed the leaves and grass from the back of my pants. I don't suppose you have an extra gun I could borrow. His caterpillar-like brows rose. You know how to shoot? My brothers taught me. He looked me over as if weighing the truth in my words and nodded toward the rifle. You care to prove it? Nodding, I walked to the gun, picked it up, and checked the cartridges. What do you want me to shoot? He ran his hand over his scraggly beard. I'll send Saint into the brush to rustle up some birds. Bring one down and I'll get you what you need. The dog lifted his head at the mention of his name. Cyril whistled and swung his arm in the direction of a thick crop of bushes. Saint, yeah. The dog moved faster than I would have thought possible for such a droopy creature. I lifted the rifle, aimed at the sky, and waited. A burst of caws and flapping wings filled the air, but I kept my eye trained on the area above the brush. I exhaled a breath and pulled the trigger. Once, twice, three times. My ears revolted and my hearing dimmed, but a couple of birds fell from the sky. Ooh-wee, Cher! Laughing, Cyril bent at the waist and put his hands on his thighs. You weren't blowing smoke. I don't know that I could drop two in one go. Lowering the rifle, I smiled. Thanks, I was worried I was out of practice. He pulled a bandana from his pocket and wiped the back of his neck. Name your poison, Cher. Do you have anything smaller with more rounds? 
I winked. Chapter 23, Marco. Why is it errands take six times longer when you have something to do after they're done? Any other day, I would have been in and out of the drugstore in five minutes tops. But you know what they say about plans. The best ones get later, something like that. It had taken two hours to reach the marina after I'd taken a wrong turn that put me on the scenic route to the freaking gulf. By the time I got my bearings, I'd invented new and creative uses of the English language. Needless to say, I added a compass to my list. The visit to the superstore felt more like a sociology project than a shopping trip. This far south, it was more of a community center to catch up with the neighbors than a mere grocery and everything else under the sun store. I'd never seen such a diverse cross-section of the population, nor did I care to again. On the way back to the marina, Leo called. Hey, bro. I figured by now my family, if not the entire island of Sicily, knew about my marriage. Calling to congratulate me? Where are you right now? Ah, it's going to be one of those calls. I'm driving, what's up? Do me a favor and pull off the road. Easing the SUV under the shoulder, I couldn't decide if he sounded more stressed, angry, or upset. My mind immediately went to our father's failing health. How's Pops? He's better today, sitting outside with Gabe and Maggie's bunch. I'd never get used to people referring to Joe and Rebecca's kids as Gabe and Maggie's. It seemed disrespectful somehow, even if they were raising him. Good to hear. I'm parked. Leo drew a deep breath. Is it true? You married Nico? It's true. I was able to find the marriage license online, but not the certificate signed by the priest. The lift in the last word made the statement sound like a question. He's holding the paperwork until the 30-day deadline to keep it quiet. Good, then there's time. Leo's voice deepened. Get the certificate back and burn it. What? No. What the hell is wrong with him? This isn't a game. We're in love. I'm sorry to hear that, but you two went about this the wrong way. Pietro Lazio is making noise that you disrespected him and his family by not asking his permission to marry his daughter. So I'll send him a card or something, but I'm not going to pretend we aren't married. I couldn't do that to either of us. I love her. Grow the fuck up, he shouted. You don't think I love Dahlia? You don't think it kills me to pretend I don't want her every second of every day? To watch her struggle to raise our... Oh, the truth finally comes out. Leo and Dahlia had danced the Just Friends dance for as long as I could remember, but they'd always insisted there was nothing more between them. Raise your what? Nothing. My throat went dry. Dahlia had a little boy, but I couldn't remember her ever mentioning the kid's father. Holy shit. Is Gunner yours? Leo growled. No, he's hers. You want to know why? Not really. I want you to answer the damn question. Why? Because being a Marchioni means we don't get to make decisions like the rest of the world. We have to think three steps ahead of our enemies. We can't afford to be sentimental or follow our goddamned hearts. He took a breath. When he spoke again, he lowered his voice. This marriage has put you, Nico, and everyone you love in danger. You need to end it before there's bloodshed. Gripping the phone hard enough to crack the case, I said, Lazio had no problem selling her into marriage with Enzo. Leo scoffed. Because he thought he'd get something out of it. And so did the rest of you. I ground my teeth. Is this really about me pissing off Lazio, or is it about me messing up Gabe's plans to get us out of the mob? He barked out a humorless laugh. Gabe was against Enzo marrying Nico from the beginning, remember? And he's not going to tell you like it is. Marrying Maggie has made him sentimental. True, but there had to be a way to make this work. I'll talk to my father-in-law, lick his boots, whatever I need to do to make this right. There is no making it right. If you love her half as much as you say you do, you'll destroy the marriage certificate and walk away. I disconnected the call and rested my forehead on the steering wheel. While his delivery sucked, Leo was right. Marrying Nico had been reckless, but I couldn't stand the thought of her being forced to marry someone else. Selfishly, I wanted her for myself. But more than that, I wanted her to have the freedom to build the life she wanted on her terms. The trip back to the marina went by in a blur. As I navigated the boat through the unmarked waterways, I couldn't get Leo's words out of my head. More so, I couldn't stop thinking about the sacrifices he'd made to protect Dahlia and his kid. Could I do that? 
Now that I'd realized how much I loved Nico, could I pretend we were just friends? Could I watch her raise our future children alone? And for what? To keep the peace between the families? This is different. Dahlia's the governor's daughter, for Christ's sake. Nico was a mob princess. She knows how things work better than I do. Lazio might be willing to sell her hand in exchange for power, but he'd never physically hurt her. Would he? Still lost in a personal thought bubble, I secured the John boat to the dock and grabbed the shopping bags. I couldn't decide what, if anything, I should tell Nico about Leo's call. My head told me to lay it all out for her. My heart said the news would hurt her, and my dick reminded me of the box of condoms I'd purchased. He didn't get a vote. I turned for the stairs and spotted a snake. A cold shot of adrenaline coursed through me. Not two feet from me sat a water moccasin sunning itself on the dock. Son of a bitch! Common sense told me to slowly move away, but I had a problem. Backing up meant stepping down into the boat, blind. Because there was no way in hell I was going to take my eyes off the snake. You're back. Nico started down the stairs toward me. Staring down the three-foot-long death machine, I said, Stop! Don't come closer. Snake, stay still. She went back inside the cabin. It wasn't like she could do much to help, but damn it, I hadn't expected her to leave me to die alone. A gunshot tore through the bayou, and pain bloomed in my leg. For one terrifying second, I thought Lazio's men had found us, and I'd been hit. Then it dawned on me. Not only had we been found, but it bit me. Another shot tore through the air as I dove for the boat. Oh my God. Nico hurried down the stairs, stepped over the groceries and supplies, littering the dock, and climbed into the boat. Stay down, someone's shooting at us. I pressed my hand to the source of the pain and swooned when my fingers came away slick with blood. She eased me back. Marco, it's okay, I fired the gun. You? My leg throbbed in time with my heart. Hospital, you have to drive. As if confused, she glanced from me to the dock and back. I need to see your leg. Spots danced before my eyes. It's the neurotoxins hitting my bloodstream. Babe, there's no time. I need you to start the engine and get me to the marina. Nico huffed and did something to my calf that sent a shock of pain from my toes to my groin. Ow, cut it out. My heart raced, not a good thing considering the faster it beat, the faster the venom would spread. Call 911. Tell them to send an air ambulance to the marina. Marco, look. She waved a bloody piece of wood in front of my face. What the hell is that? The world's largest splinter. A grin tugged at the corners of her mouth. I'm pretty sure it's a piece of the dock. It must have come off when I shot the snake. You shot the snake? Rubbing a tender spot on the back of my head, I said, maybe I have a concussion. Nothing's making sense. Where did you get a gun? Ciro lent me a forty-five caliber pistol after he saved me from an alligator, and I shot some birds. You shot birds too? Nico took my face in her hands and met my gaze. My love, you had a very large splinter near the other cut on your leg. No one's shooting at us, and the snake is dead. The pieces fell into place, but the picture they created put my man card in serious jeopardy. Right, gotcha. I'm starved. Probably low blood sugar making me confused. She gave me side eye as she climbed from the boat. I made dinner. Yeah? I stood and forced myself not to limp as I joined her on the dock. Nico took one of the plastic bags, wrapped it around her hand like a makeshift glove, and reached for the snake. I grabbed her shoulder. Don't touch it. It could still bite you. Marco, it's in pieces. It can't hurt me. My stomach clenched every time I glanced at the damn thing. Haven't you ever seen someone kill a chicken? The body moves after you cut its head off. Nico rolled her eyes and proceeded to shove the snake parts into the water. Honestly, sometimes I can't tell when you're serious and when you're joking. Who's joking? More than a little embarrassed, I snatched a couple of bags from the dock. Let's start over. How was your day, dear? Eventful, she smirked. We should clean your boo-boo. It's a war wound, thank you very much. I followed her upstairs. Wait, what was that about a gator? I came very close to being eaten today. Nico seated me at the dining room table, took a first aid kit from the cabinet, and proceeded to nurse me back to health. I listened in horror as she described her near-death experience with a freaking alligator. 
Somehow, hearing her story made my reaction to the snake seem that much more ridiculous. Especially once Nico convinced me it hadn't been a water moccasin, but a harmless black snake. I should just hand her my balls for safekeeping. Miserable at the thought of her putting herself in danger, I propped my chin in my hand. I'm glad Cyril was there, but you shouldn't be wandering around out here by yourself. I was bored and needed to get some fresh air. Besides the gator, I had a great day. I sketched some of the scenery and started working on a few new designs. Practical clothes, fashion forward, but items women can wear in the real world. Nico set a glass of wine in front of me. I'd love to see them. Being home, having a normal conversation with my wife made the stress of the day fade into background noise. Whatever you're cooking smells great, her cheeks flushed. I'm not really cooking, I'm warming up Hildy's lasagna. I pulled her into my lap and kissed the shell of her ear. It's the thought that counts. Oh, she jumped up and hurried to the fridge. We have dessert. Wiggling my brows, I said, the only dessert I want is you. Nico brought a pink pastry box to the table and opened the lid. Inside was a small white cake with intricate swirls of frosting, marzipan flowers, and two gold rings. It's our wedding cake. That must have been what Hildy meant when she said she'd added something special. Not everyone is against our marriage. The thought had me blinking back tears. Thankfully, Nico didn't seem to notice. She took the cake back into the kitchen and pulled our dinner out of the oven. It needs to bake for ten more minutes uncovered. I moved to her side. Need some help? No, I can handle it. Using a fork and a pot holder, she removed the aluminum foil. A slew of murmured curse words fell from her lips. I glanced over her shoulder and winced. Is that melted plastic wrap? Chapter 24, Nicolina. Our first dinner as a married couple consisted of grilled cheese sandwiches, cake, and wine, but Marco didn't seem to mind. He'd polished off his food in less than five minutes and was working on his third glass of Merlot. However, he was clearly distracted, and I had the feeling it had nothing to do with our run-ins with Mother Nature. I held the last bite of wedding cake to his mouth. Do you want to talk about it? I had a chat with Leo today. He's not exactly supportive of our marriage. Staring into my eyes, Marco closed his lips around the fork. I'm still in a mild state of shock myself. I'm sure it's worse for our families. They'll come around, he finished his wine. But right now, there are a hundred things I'd rather be doing with you besides talking. I can think of a few myself. I stood to clear the dishes, but he took my hand and pulled me to the fold-out couch. Shouldn't we clean up? Later. He drew me into his arms and kissed a path from my lips to my neck. I missed you today. I missed you too. I draped my arms over his shoulders. Tell me about these hundred things you want to do to me. I'd rather show you. He eased me back onto the lumpy mattress and traced a line down the center of my body. Goosebumps rose on my arms, but heat pooled in my core. The clashing sensations left me breathless, a condition that became much worse when Marco tugged his shirt over his head. I reached for him, letting my fingertips play over the ridges and dips of his abs. He was beautiful. Michelangelo's David come to life. Are you sure you're up for it? You're injured? I couldn't help but tease him. The way he'd reacted to the snake made me giggle every time I thought about it. Frowning, he lifted his pant leg to inspect his wound. I think I'll live. Good, because I have a serious condition, and I believe you said you had the cure? I did. He stared a second or two, then laughed. Oh, right, your virginity. Mm-hmm. I crooked my finger at him. Less talk, more action. Marco slipped out of his jeans and stretched out beside me. Nervous? A little. I pulled my t-shirt off and wiggled out of my shorts before rolling to my side to face him. But I trust you. This time, when he kissed me, he wasted no time teasing. It felt different than the night before. More like a claiming than an exchange. I opened for him, 
taking everything he had to give and returning it in kind. Tangling my fingers in his dark curls, I pressed closer until there was no space between us. Marco slid his thigh between mine, sending a jolt of pleasure through my body. We stayed in that position, kissing, groping, grinding until I thought I'd go insane before he gave me what I wanted. Rather than waiting for him to make the next move, I eased back and pressed my palm against his hard length. Marco nipped my lower lip and pushed his hips forward. Is there something you want? You? He cupped my face and brushed his thumb over my lower lip. Marrying you was the best thing I've ever done. Me too, I whispered, tugging at his boxer briefs. Take these off. Yes, dear. Marco removed them and my panties before I could blink. Where did you put those condoms? We haven't been married long enough for you to start asking me where everything is. Uh-uh, none of that. I've waited my entire life to be inside you. I intend to make it last. He strode to the kitchen and returned with the entire box of condoms. I watched as he ripped open a packet and rolled the thin material over his length. The rubber didn't look comfortable at all. In fact, it reminded me of my non-nus compression socks. I'll go on the pill as soon as I can find a doctor. I'm all for that. He crawled back into bed and pulled me toward him. Lay like you were before. Really? I did as he asked, but wasn't entirely sure how the face-to-face -face position would work. Marco lifted my thigh and guided my knee over his hip. Once he had me in position, he slipped his hand between my legs. I thought, my words died on my tongue when he pushed his fingers inside me. Between the pressure from the base of his palm and the slight stretching in my core, he had me writhing in the space between two heartbeats. Marco continued until I went boneless in his arms before easing me to my back. Hovering over me, he said, tell me if you need me to stop. I nodded, but sucked in a breath when I felt his length pressing against me. Relax. Easy for you to say. Meet me in the middle, he whispered against my cheek. I rolled my hips up as he pushed forward, slowly joining our bodies. Marco cupped the back of my neck and rested his brow against mine. You feel incredible. Exhaling a breath, I forced myself to relax instead of resisting the slow, steady pressure. Once he'd seated himself fully inside me, he blew out a slow breath and eased back, only to repeat the process. Are you okay? Better than okay. I brushed my lips against his and raised my hips to meet him midway. The resulting pleasure had me gasping. Much better than okay. I lost myself in him. The weight of his body, the warmth of his skin, the spicy scent of his cologne overwhelmed my senses. This was nothing like the hookups my friends had talked about. What Marco and I shared went so much deeper. I'd never felt closer to another person. He quickened the pace and kissed me like a blind man using his lips to read the contours of my face. I can't hold back much longer. Don't. Marco pressed his cheek to mine and moved quicker, harder, deeper. He met my gaze, gave one final thrust, and moaned my name. There were moments in life when words only got in the way. There was absolutely nothing we could have said that would convey more than the way he smiled and brushed his thumb over my lower lip. Marco rolled to his back and pulled me against his side. We stayed curled up beneath the blankets, listening to the crickets singing and our hearts beating until the last of the sunlight faded. Want to watch a movie? I found some old DVDs in the cabinet. I lifted my head and placed a series of kisses along his collarbone. Or we could do that again. We'll do it again and often, but you might be sore tonight. He rolled his head to the side and grinned. Don't suppose there's a copy of Thelma and Louise? That's rather specific. I don't think so, why? 
We checked one item off the list of things you've never done. I figured we'd check off another. He spoke in a sexy, gravelly voice that had me clenching my thighs. How do you remember every tiny detail of our conversations? It might have something to do with the fact I've been mesmerized by you since we were kids. Keep sugar talking me, and it won't matter how sore I am. He grinned. Sweet talking. Same thing. I reached for my shirt, but he snatched it away. You don't need that. Is that so? Warmth spread through my chest. I loved him. This, us. I wished we could stay in the cabin forever. But sooner or later, the outside would demand our attention. Throwing my shirt toward the kitchen, he said, New rule, no clothes allowed after dark. I like that rule. I stood and stretched my arms over my head. But I'm picking the movie. Marco pressed his palms together and closed his eyes. Holy Father, if you're listening, please let there be a yoga DVD. You're incorrigible, I tossed a pillow at him. Incorrigible, horny for my wife, in love, same difference. He propped himself up on one elbow. You sure you don't want to have more sex? I'll be okay as long as you're gentle. Marco Sal rang before he could answer. Second new rule, I turn my phone off when the sun sets. He fished around for his jeans. I like that one too. Marco brought the phone to his ear. Marchioni. I held my breath while waiting for his reaction. Alessio. No, you aren't interrupting anything. He laughed and spoke in Italian. We're on our honeymoon. What could you possibly be interrupting? Marco. I lunged for the phone, but he held me off. I'm kidding, but yes, Nico and I were married. He went quiet. Yes, sir, I understand. Rest assured, I love her too much to ever hurt her. Oh boy, I almost fell bad for him having to endure one of Alessio's lectures. Blushing from his cheeks to the tip of his ears, he handed me the phone. Pronto, Alessio? My heart lurched. With everything going on, I hadn't realized how much I'd missed them. Are you well? Any troubles? How is Maria? He chuckled. We are perfect. Are you happy, Nico? So happy. Marco and I both are. Then I am happy for you. He grumbled to someone in the room. Maria wants to speak to you. Please. I couldn't stop smiling. At the time, it hadn't bothered me that Hildy was the only one to attend our wedding, but speaking to them made me wish they'd been there. Maria's voice boomed over the line. You are married. Yes, Nonina. In a church? You didn't do as the Americans do and go to a judge. Laughing, I said, a priest gave us the sacrament in a church. And we were not there, she groaned. Her tone made my chest hurt. Marco promised me we would have another wedding, a big one with flowers and food and music. You and Alessia will come to that one. Maria sighed. That will do. Are you happy? Have you, do you need the motherly talk? I resisted the urge to roll my eyes for fear she'd know I'd done it. Marco is a good teacher. We're figuring things out as we go. Is he good to you? I hesitated. Are we still speaking of sex? Does it matter? The answer is the same in and out of bed. He is very good to me. How do you like Canton? Eh, she sounded as if she'd shrugged. The markets are too big and no one speaks to their neighbors, but it is nice to see Rosa. Marco and I will come visit you as soon as it's safe. She lowered her voice. Does your father know of your marriage? Yes, and he, I debated how much to tell her. The last thing Maria and Alessio needed was to worry about me, but she might be able to shed some light on his strange behavior. He seemed more concerned than angry. Then he mentioned secrets. She sighed and muttered a prayer to the Virgin Mary under her breath. 
Maria knows. Please, if you know something, Nico, some things are better left buried in the past. My father said there would be repercussions and bloodshed. Does this have anything to do with these secrets? I assumed he meant repercussions about the balance of power within the mafia, but now I wasn't so sure. These are not things to speak of over the phone. Please, you have to tell me what you know. Your father is a stubborn man. He made some horrible mistakes over the years. She sighed. What kind of mistakes? What does the past have to do with my marriage? Using her mom voice, she said, we will talk when you and Marco come to visit. For now, have peace. Your parents' secrets are theirs. They have nothing to do with you. Don't allow your father to ruin your happiness. For the first time in my life, I didn't believe her. We will come as soon as it's safe. Do you have pictures of the wedding? A couple. I'll text them to you. I swallowed past the lump in my throat. I have to go. Ciao, Maria. Ciao, Nico. Marco took the phone from my hand, set it on the nightstand, and drew me into his arms. What did she say? Nothing useful. Only that we would talk face to face. When do you want to go to Canton? He met my gaze. When we know my father has called off his dogs and accepts our marriage. Resting my head on his chest, I prayed that day would come soon. Nick, not for nothing, but my mother couldn't stand Joe and Gabe's wives while they were dating. His lips curled into his thinking about sex smile. What does that have to do with us? I can't believe I'm going to say this. His expression grew serious. The one thing that no parent can resist is a grandchild. It's a good thing he was holding me, otherwise I would have fainted. You want a baby? Now? He hitched a shoulder. Ma changed her tune about Rebecca and Maggie when she found out they were pregnant. Your father may do the same. You want to impregnate me to appease my father. I pulled away and pressed my hand to my stomach as if to keep him away from my womb. We'd gone into this thinking the marriage was temporary. We'd skipped premarital counseling with a priest, which was where couples discussed things like finances and living arrangements and children. Marco frowned. Forget it, it was a stupid idea. I nodded slowly, still trying to make sense of what was happening. We've only been married 24 hours. It's way too soon to start thinking about having kids. He ran his hand over his head. We should wait, at least a year. Spend some time traveling, buy a house. First he says now, then he says a year. I sank to the edge of the bed. I don't want to bring a child into this world to force our parents to accept our marriage. But I do want to have a family with you. Yeah? His eyes widened. Are you sure? Babies are always leaking from one end or the other, and they're noisy. I'm scared what happened to my mom will happen to me. And I know absolutely nothing about raising kids, but yes, I'm sure. He knelt in front of me. Medicine has come a long way in 26 years. But if you're worried, we can see a specialist to make sure everything, he motioned to my midsection, is working properly. Thanks, but I saw a specialist in Paris. He said all of my pieces and parts are healthy, but I worry. I mean, I've asked what happened to her medically, but no one seems to know. We could get a second opinion. Marco rested his hands on my thighs. As for you knowing nothing about raising kids, we have Hildy, Maria, and Maggie to answer our questions. I couldn't help but smile. I'm sure I want to have your children. So sure, I think we should start trying tonight. Tonight? He nuzzled into my chest. I like the sound of that. It might take a few months before we get it right. True. Practice does make perfect. I slid my arms around his neck. Marco flashed me his thinking about sex smile. Or in our case, practice makes babies. I just wish we would have had this conversation before I braved a cottonmouth to get condoms. 
I gave him a patient smile. Chapter 25, Marco. Most people say the keys to a healthy marriage are communication, maintaining a balance between personal and couple interests, and forgiveness. While I agreed 100%, I'd add sex, both the quality and quantity, somewhere near the top of the list. Marital bliss in the bayou consisted of all of the above and then some. I glanced up from the sales contract for yet another marquee owned business and grinned. Not because I found anything particularly amusing in selling off bits and pieces of my family's holding. Quite the contrary. I freaking hated it. What put the shit-eating grin on my face? My bride, sitting in the center of a tsunami of fabric while wearing absolutely freaking lutely nothing. Nico had used the messy bun on the top of her head as a pencil holder and currently held three straight pins between her lips. She had a smudge on her right cheek and a determined look on her face. Hands down, she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen, and I was the lucky SUB who had married her. She took the pins from her mouth, attached two pieces of fabric together, and smiled. Why are you looking at me like that? Like what? I set my laptop on the end table, dropped to the floor, and crawled toward her. Like this. She flashed me a goofy grin as she cleared a path in the pieces of sheet she cut up for the pattern. You should be focusing on work. I'd rather focus on you. Still on all fours, I nuzzled into her neck, and my phone rang. She placed her hands on my shoulders and eased me back. Saved by the bell. Holy smokes, you got an idiom right. Laughing, I went for her chest. Very funny, wise man. Once again, she pushed me away. You should answer that. Wise man. Without taking my eyes off her, I reached behind me for the cell. Marchione. Marco, it's Terra Cole. Is this a bad time? My body screamed. Yes, but I said, nope, what's up? Are you still in Palermo? Nico tilted her head and arched her brow. Terra sucked in a breath. Yes, I am. I just got back from the meeting with the, with the, you know. I couldn't decide if she was confused or reluctant or some combination of the two. That had to be nerve wracking, Tara. How did it go? My wife frowned at the mention of the other woman's name. Honestly, I have no idea. I told them what I knew and answered their questions, but they just sat there staring at me stone faced. She sighed. Gabe said I did well, but you know, Gabe, he's too nice to hurt anyone's feelings. Gabe, nice? Since when? I'm sure you did great. She sighed again, louder than before. That's not why I'm calling. There's something I need to tell you. Her tone made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Okay. Remember when we were together? Her voice thinned. Uh-huh. My brain skidded to a halt. While it had never happened to me personally, I imagined every I'm pregnant or I have an STD conversation started with some variation of Remember when we had sex? This is an awful thing to say over the phone. I had no idea how much of the conversation Nico could hear, but judging by her expression, she'd heard more than I would have liked. I stood and put some distance between myself and her scissors and straight pins. Tara groaned on the other end of the call. I'm not good at this. Just spit it out. Fine. Gabe told me you were married to Nicolina Lazio. That's right. I glanced at my frowning wife. You told me about Nico a few times, but you never used her last name. I didn't put two and two together until today. I'm not following you. In fact, I wasn't sure I wanted to know whatever it was she was trying to tell me. Nico and I are married, happily married. Her voice rose. That's great, but her name stood out to me because I overheard Sofia Abruzzo telling her people they get paid when Lazio's payments arrived. I sank into a chair and rested my elbows on the dining room table. I see. Did you mention this to Gabe? No, I wanted to talk to you first, you know, since you're involved with the Lazio. Is it the same person Sophia was talking about? Could she be playing you? Tara had always loved a conspiracy theory. Normally I'd humor her, but I was fresh out of patience. I appreciate your concern, but it's not the same person. Are you sure? I mean, we talked, what, a month ago? You didn't mention you were even dating anyone, and now you're married? Because it's none of your fucking business. I drew in a breath and forced myself to calm down. Let it go. Nico's eyes widened. I knew that she was upset, but any doubt vanished when she slid into a bathrobe and white-knuckled a cloth belt. Tara gasped. It is my business. I care about you. 
care? You care so much about me that you spied on my family for years? My brother is dead because of you. You're lucky to be alive. I'm sorry, she squeaked out the words. I didn't know they were going to hurt Joe and Rebecca. Nico moved behind me and rested her hands on my shoulders. That's just it. You don't know what you don't know, and it's going to get you or other people killed. Stay out of my business. Tara started to say something, but I disconnected the call. Nico slid her arms around me and whispered into my ear. Breathe in and out, slowly. I hung my head. How much of that did you hear? Not much. She rested her cheek on my shoulder blade. Tara overheard Sophia telling her men they'd get paid once your father's money arrived. I turned to face her. She could have it wrong. Or she could be right. Nico caressed my cheek. Why would your father hire Sophia Abruzzo to do his dirty work? I didn't know either of them, but something about the situation didn't seem right. A better question is, why would Sophia Abruzzo work for my father? Nico plopped into the chair across from me. Remember when you asked me how I knew so much about the business? Yes. My stomach soured. I had a feeling I wasn't going to like where this conversation would lead. Like me, Sophia and her sister Francesca grew up in the mafia. So did my brothers and I, but that doesn't mean... No, you don't understand. Nico shook her head. You moved to the States when you were still young. Plus, it's different with boys. You grew up with the understanding that Joe would take your father's place. He was groomed to have a seat at the table, to join the Fratalanza. Girls are taught how to smile and look pretty. She had a point, but I didn't like it. Go on. Sophia has always been bossy. She used to boast that she'd take over for her father one day. Nico hitched a shoulder. Then Tommaso named his son his heir, and Sophia went from bossy to power hungry and violent. I can understand why. Tommy Jr. is an idiot. She grinned. You're right, but a stupid boy beats out a brilliant girl every time in our world. Once again, I found myself wincing at mob politics. You think your father promised Sophia some sort of position in his organization? Yes, but I don't think he'll go through with it. At most, he'll force one of my brothers to marry the cycle. I couldn't help but laugh. You really don't like her, do you? From what Maria tells me, Sophia was close to my mother. She was 10 when I was born. Nico dipped her chin and lowered her voice. She blames me for her death. That's ridiculous. I could understand how a kid might feel that way, but Sophia Abruzzo was in her 30s. Maybe so, but last time we spoke, she threatened to kill me and piss on my grave. Ouch. Okay, no family reunions with the Abruzzos. Definitely not. She laughed softly. Call Gabe. He needs to know you found a possible connection between the Abruzzos and my father. I'll put him on speaker. I'd like your input on anything that has to do with the business. I scrolled through my contacts. You don't have to do that to make me feel better. I've accepted being born into a mafia family without a penis. I, for one, am very, very glad you were born with an innie instead of an Audi. But that's not why I'm doing this. I squeezed her hand. You're wicked smart and know the players and the politics better than I do. Nico sat a little straighter. I love you. I love you too. I dialed Gabe's number. Marco, I was just about to call you. Gabe's words came out in a huff. It's been a hell of a day. Tell me about it. I winked at my wife. Nico's here with me. We need to catch you up to speed on a few things before I ask how the meeting went. Good. That'll give me time to knock back this scotch. Gabe laughed, but it lacked his usual humor. Nico and I spent the first five minutes explaining the conversation with Tara, Sophia Abruzzo's psyche, and the grim realities of being born female in a mafia family. Gabe cleared his throat. First of all, you're right about Miss Abruzzo. She's definitely angling for power, but after today, she'll have a hard time getting it. What happened? Nico glanced from the phone to me and frowned. Long story short, she was ordered to return to Palermo. Enzo's waitress caused quite a stir after she spoke to the Capos. The news gave me hope at least one of the family standing against us would be muzzled. They believed Tara's testimony about the poison? Yes, but the weird thing was, Tommaso seemed shocked by the entire thing. He chuckled, which makes sense if Pietro was the one calling the shots. Nico's voice wavered. 
Even if Tara testifies, Sophia and my father will deny it. We'll need tangible proof. I scratch my jaw. I'll have our guys in IT double down on hacking into Lazio's network. I know some of his passwords. I may be able to help. She glanced away. Thanks, Nico. Gabe sighed. This can't be easy for you. I'll be fine. But Tara and her kids are in even more danger. You'll continue their protection? Absolutely. Who knows what else she might remember. The tinkling of ice cubes against glass filled the line. If we're done here, I stood and stretched. Cool your jets, he chuckled. Is it me or are the companies we put on the market selling faster than normal? They are. I'd meant to send him an email expressing my concerns about that very subject, but my wife's boobs had distracted me. Even the property in freaking North Dakota went at full price. You're looking into it, Gabe asked. Two steps ahead of you, bro, I lied through my teeth. I'll have something to you as soon as possible. Thanks. Enjoy the honeymoon, his voice softened. And Nico, welcome to the family.